Today's episode's brought to you by Boycotting Instagram because it doesn't matter. Overwatch today's going to post memes. Drop the beat. Welcome to High Noon Podcast, the competitive Overwatch podcast. I am your host, Sublevins, and with me, as always, is Deathblow. What's up, buddy? Not too much. What's going on? Not too much. For a second, I thought that my title on, on the thing said Belvins and that you had just put that there like months ago waiting for me to notice. <laughs> Sounds like something I would do. It really does, and it would have been a really good long con, but it uh, didn't happen. Now you can't do it. Um, but hello everyone thank you for stopping by let's just jump right into it because we do of course because of the magic of our official booker mr a smith we do have another interview to throw to you at the end of today's show or i guess kind of at the middle and it will close out the show so without further ado let's jump right into it first and foremost we've got some new patron hype we actually have a local mr kashian Kashian, a local Buffalo Buffalonian whose uh, Patreon message was simply Buffalo Overwatch. So huge thank you uh, to Mr. Kashian. I believe he might even be in the chat today. Um, but uh, yeah, so huge thanks. And uh, if you guys uh, want to support the show financially, you never have to. But if you ever wanted to, you can go to patreon.com slash high noon podcast. Um, and yeah, always nice to see local people. If there's any, if there's anyone in the Buffalo area that listens, let us know. You know, you don't have to uh, go on Patreon and 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 donate to us. You can just let us know either on Twitter or on our now public Discord channel. Uh, the link of to which is on highnoonpodcast.com. So, huge thanks and all that good stuff. Shoutouts to Buffalo Overwatch. Um, so let's move right along to what did we do last week? Death, do you want to start it out? Yeah, absolutely. So it's the first week of the season, which means I'm doing my placement games. And, uh, so I, I get on and in the first day I manage all 10 of mine on my main account and I placed in diamond or I'm sorry, in masters. Uh, so nice. Season done. I'm out. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) I get to turn into Blevins for a season. Um, But, uh, you know, in all honesty, it's just uh, really great. I think everybody is is widely uh, very happy with the changes they made to the season structure. Mm -hmm. Uh, So I was really, really pleased with that. Uh, It's really nice not to just get demoted about four or five hundred SR just because the, you know, the the month rolled over Mm -hmm. or the season ended or whatever happened. Um, So, yeah, I also did some placements on my meme account and I'm talking meme account. I mean, the first five games were my mono junk rat <laughs> actually the first seven games were mono um, junk rat um uh, a little bit of may a little bit of hanzo and a little bit of torbjorn it was all nice. that was played and that account is in diamond already and i have no <laughs> idea how um so that was a whole lot of fun uh, just getting to just play the stupidest stuff uh, imaginable is is always a really good time um i don't like that account in diamond though because i keep it around to play with some of my low SR friends and things like that sometimes. Yeah. Uh, so it's a Hi. little unfortunate Hi. you have to do that work. Hi. Yeah, now you have to like demote it. No, you're, you're plat. I'm talking yeah. about like, you know, silver and gold oh, friends, okay. uh, things like that. So I'm going to have to tank it a little bit, I think. But, uh, you know, if I wasn't able to do that on accident by playing Junkrat, who knows how it's going to work. Well, there was a point in time when Junkrat's win percentage was at like 75%. Oh, well, there was a time when my Junkrat win percentage on the season was at 100%. <laughs> Um, but what's even more, what's even more surprising than that was if you took a look at your friends list while you were playing those placement matches, you may have noticed a, an old friend. On... You didn't play that much. Oh, it was me. <laughs> I was on. I played, I think, five or six placement matches. I just, just ground them out. So put, put your beard bed up. It'll be done today. If you're not done... <laughs> By this time next week, from the live recording of next week, sure. uh, you're going to have one week to finish them before that beard goes all away. All right, all right. It, I'm, but, I accept the terms. But I'm also, also very, very proud of you for actually playing this game that you podcast about on a weekly basis. Ooh. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. No, I am um, surprisingly enough, 
Um, so I, I did a couple placement matches, and I was I was doing really bad because you know um, I, I barely ever play. play. Oh, I'm terrible. <laughs> I'm really bad at the game. Um, I realized that I just need to play Lucio <laughs> and let other people do the work and not get mad if I lose, which I started doing. I, I tried to play Diva and uh, Zarya, and it just was not it was not clicking like it normally would. So I think I'm gonna be I'm gonna be Lucio for the rest of the matches. What was really surprising to me was I actually played some Deathmatch, and it was actually kind of fun. Uh, it, it was a fun match. Now, obviously, it means nothing. It's arcade or whatever. You're just playing for, like, a loot box or whatever. But in terms of, like, the actual enjoyment I got from playing it, it was it was, it was was pretty good. Um, I don't it, – it still it still seems pretty wacky and zany and, and seems kind of abusable. So I don't think it will ever be any sort of even, like, offshoot tournament, like where you would run a, a – maybe a team death match, but definitely not – uh, a solo free for all death match. It just gets too weird. And some of the characters are just really weird. Um, yeah. It's, it's really like the first game mode that I thought has carries some value to a competitive player in just a warm up sense. I mean, you're not going to do oh, anything yeah. crazy with it, uh, but it's probably better than just like, you know, Anna headshot only bot, mm -hmm. uh, you know, aim practice, which is, it's pretty good. And I wouldn't give that up completely, but uh, I do know some people that, you know, when they're getting ready to scrim, uh, it's a different ball game, right? To shoot at stupid bots that will stop mm -hmm. moving randomly. And you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Things like that. Uh, when compared to shooting mm -hmm. against live people. Uh, one thing that I do think is really funny. I don't know if you remember Yankee from my old team. Yeah. Um, he's got this like arcade mode curse and he played some death match and had, um, Gale, uh, one of the, one of the big streamers, Gale on his team, and then Jesus on the other team. Um, so he's just got like this crazy weird arcade MMR that puts him against top 500s and GMs all the time, and he sends screenshots of it. And it was so funny because from somebody that would actually get use out of the game modes, they're like unplayable to him because he just can't <laughs> can't ever play against regular human beings. Yeah. Like all he plays against are the supreme most talented players in the game. No, it's uh, fine. That's you just, just play Symmetra and you cheese it. I would love it. Like it would make me play arcade mode if I could go in there and and you know get to shoot Jesus. I, I feel so weird to say. <laughs> thanks for that name, Jesus. Uh, you make me say thanks. Uh, at least you <laughs> but, don't. Yeah. At least you don't have to shoot my dong. Um, but long story short, I was I was pleasantly surprised at how much fun uh, it felt. Uh, it felt a lot more like old Halo than it did like Overwatch. But it felt like Halo with Overwatch skins like an Overwatch skin on top of it, which was pretty sweet. Definitely useful. Um, I, I, I do agree that it would be, be it's better warm-up than just Anna Headshot Bot. I'll just go reset the Halo reference timer. Yeah. <laughs> it's now been zero episodes yeah. since a Halo <laughs> reference. <laughs> Thanks Fal a lot, Blev. Phelan is still uh, bleeding in. Um, but let's move right along to what did you guys do last week? And... We're downright upset. We are, what we are. very mad at yeah. a large institution. Yeah, probably like a Fortune 500 company. And I don't care. Uh, You've earned our disrespect. I don't disrespect. know about that. But it could be. I don't know. It's a don't bigger company than we are. <laughs> um, and that company is Instagram. Yeah, you're dead to me. Very mad at you. Uh, and here's why. You deleted Overwatch Today's Instagram account. And here's what's even worse. You didn't even say why. I just said violated terms of service. Answer uh, his emails. Tell him why. It was a huge account. What is? What are we as an Overwatch community supposed to do without dank memes? I, I mean, the only answer is get them from from uh, you know Big Fish in another location. Uh, he's right, still going, going to make to dank memes. Uh, we will give him whatever platform. I will give him access to our website, and we'll make a memes page on mm -hmm, the website mm -hmm. if I have to to make sure that he gets to continue to send you guys dank memes. Yeah, good luck uh, trying to take that down, Instagram, you idiots. Yeah, you can't. You don't own the entire internet, just your private, pathetic little food picture corner of it. Um, garbage. Yeah, okay. yeah, garbage website. Don't use it. Uh, until they reinstate Overwatch today back on Instagram, there is no reason to use that platform, and we ask all of you to blindly follow our rage, whether you share it or not, because yep. what good is doing a podcast if you can't wield a torch-wielding mob? I don't know. If you can't uh, field a torch-wielding mob. Right, exactly. Uh, so know, that's, that's what we're here for. So really, the action item here is Deathblow sent an angry tweet to Instagram. Just go ahead, like that one, retweet it, and add to the add fuel to the fire against Instagram because and, you know what that's malarkey. Yeah, tell him why. Even if he did violate terms of service, that's fine. We're adults; we can accept that. You got to tell us why, though. Yeah, 
and plus, like, since when do you not get a couple of strikes? Right. Like, what right. is it like? You oh, you've, oh, nope. Yeah, no oh. warning, no nothing. Just oh, and you're gone. Yeah, it's not like a like a suspension where it's like, okay, this is what you did wrong, and make sure you don't do it again. It's like a nope, account's gone, which is which is garbage. So, um, screw Instagram, uh, and uh, you should uh, uninstall the app and uh, write angry angry things to the company. But just because that happened does not mean that we are still not going to highlight Overwatch today. Meme of the week. Oh yeah, you best believe that we're still doing Overwatch today. Meme of the week. Uh, there's no way that we're not doing that. So, uh, this week, um, we've got, (laughs) this is what, this is what I really felt like actually playing my, (laughs) playing my, my placements. It's a picture. It's, um, it's a person cooking something over a pot and they've got a, a, a little, uh, vial of what looks like sugar and it says me trying to help my team in competitive and it says i throw in sugar and then there's a huge flame in the second picture that says oh my god that's salt i'm an idiot that's and also that's not a vial that's called a ramekin okay pretty sure well i give you 10 points for knowing what the actual term of that was and i was just mind blanking on having something to say so i just said the first word that came to mind so 10 points 10 points for death flow minus 20 for me um but yes yeah, so um yeah long story short um screw instagram yeah we hate you yeah, hate you but we love you overwatch today stick around don't yes. go anywhere don't don't, don't we'll get you anywhere. back don't don't touch that dial <laughs> but let's move right along to it's tournament talk we have got some contenders to talk about we do and we had this weekend we had one of those super weekends right we talked about when the schedule got announced how some of these were going to be played on friday as well Mm -hmm. Uh, and what they decided to do is alternate na and eu every other week and just play an extra two matches for each region on the friday Mm -hmm. so this week we had two extra matches of na action and next week we will have two extra matches of eu action all of those playing out on friday and i believe it'll be the same time but they might actually adjust the friday airing time to hit the eu audience i'm not 100 percent sure on that yes yes and i and this weekend for at least for north america was labor day weekend Mm-hmm. So I know Death, you had some nice time to deep dive and, and take a look and watch a lot of these matches. I did. I have like nine pages of notes on these <laughs> matches. So any any questions you have, whether we cover it or not, you ask me because otherwise, you know, most of these pages and notes will go to waste. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, so let's start out, and I'm going to go through the results, and then we can go back and uh, you, we can do the uh, deep dive. So we saw um, Gamers Origins lose to Team Gigante. Three to one, so Giganti wins that one. Three to one, uh, Misfits uh, stomping out Singularity four nothing. Uh, Cloud nine three ones Bazooka Puppies, and then one two three takes down E United three to one. Yeah, definitely. And a couple things to kind of point out on the matches that we're not going to to go super deep into. In that Cloud9 match against Bazooka Puppies, I, Cloud9 had that. I mean, they were yeah. locked up. <laughs> they had the 4-0 ready to go. And in the last map on Gibraltar, they just seemed to like completely give it up. Uh, it, it was really funny, too, kind of watching that, and it wasn't actually... Uh, yeah, it was the last map on Gibraltar. So it, it was really interesting. There was this this interesting dynamic in that match where Nash actually played Widowmaker for almost, like, the entire map, and it really seemed to, like, carry on it, like, do really, really well, but you, like, don't ever see him in the kill feed. And it was just this really, really... <laughs> I gave, like, one kill. It was more than one, but I mean, one kill that really stood out to me. And uh, it, that one was... He was dead and his mind hit somebody. Um, But it was just all about like the positioning he had when he was there and the way he forced them back into corners and gave, you know, gave uh, the other team the ability to really move in and get a lot of those kills. Mm -hmm. Uh, It was really, really 
you know, interesting and, and, and fun to watch C9 kind of react to that positioning. And, uh, you know, they were actually uh, able to full hold, Bazooka Puppies were, on that map. And I really just felt to me like C9 gave up a little bit. And if you watch that match, definitely tweet at us and let us let me know if you agree with me on that. But I, I made a note of that just because it's going to be really interesting to watch. If we look at the, the final bracket here, we see Cloud9 in fifth place, mm -hmm. two and one. And the only thing separating them from fourth place right now is one, is map. one map loss. <laughs> so if they manage to just hold it together and play out that map, they'd be sitting in fourth place right now, able to kind of decide their future a little bit. And they, you know, so it's going to be really fun to watch at the end of this tournament if cloud nine doesn't make it on the back of one map win in my mind they threw it and they gave it away and and just didn't bury bazooka puppies with a 4-0 win and gave them a map at the end um so check that map out if you know that match out and, and let me know if you agree with me on that uh you can probably just skip right to the end because for the most part it was a cloud nine stomp through and through uh you know throughout the most of the uh first three maps there so uh, the other one is, is as you mentioned, uh, Gamers Origin did drop a map to uh, Giganti, and it was really interesting to watch that because Gamers Origins was the hot team, right? Like Leaf was unbeatable on Doomfist, and, and what, was, what was finally going to break them down and, and give them their first loss of the tournament? I didn't expect them to go undefeated through groups or anything like that. Misfits and 1-2-3 both look really, really strong right now. Uh, but I don't know that I expected Giganti to be the ones to take him down with how hot, red hot they were so far throughout the you know the performances. Um, but nonetheless, it was a huge day for Linkser. Um, he had a, a lot of, of really, really strong performances. And Gamers Origins finally showed us something a little different. Like they spent a little time off of Doomfist, running Leaf on Pharah in a pharmacy combo. Mm -hmm. uh, and but at the end of the day, Linkser was was really, really big. And that whole team seems to be meshing well. Like they're a bit of a um, Ninjas in Pajamas reboot with, uh, you know, half the roster switched out with some some big names like Linkser and or actually, who was he with them at the end of mm -hmm. I don't know, I can't remember. But anyways, <laughs> uh, but anyways, yeah, they are uh, looking good now and uh, seem to be meshing well again, so it's great to see those guys kind of back, um, back in the swing of things. Yeah, and, and the only thing I would say, the first thing I thought when you, when you talked about uh, cloud nine almost like throwing a, a match or a map to bazooka puppies is like if they had some sort of like we've seen in magic tournaments like you know if you need to throw or if you need to scoop you know your buddy in or something like into top eight or, or something like that like that would make sense but just looking at like a there's we have no reason to believe that like cloud nine eu has some sort of unspoken like partnership with bazooka puppies uh and b like bazooka puppies is just so far out of <laughs> the the running that it would make no yeah. sense anyway so yeah and, and i also <clears throat> even though it's pretty it's relatively commonplace in like magic tournaments and whatnot to like you know play and and scoop and draw in a way that would put your friends or your teammates in. I, I think it's in esports, it's probably a little more frowned upon. And I would imagine Blizzard probably doesn't want that type of thing happening. Plus, like the the like Overwatch League, like you would never see that in like uh, you know the NFL or something. It's like, oh well, the Bills, the Bills uh, got a free win today because the uh, Raiders want the Patriots to have. Uh, I don't know, something like that. That would never happen in traditional sports, so I'm imagining it's probably not even going to be allowed at all in uh, Overwatch. Well, I don't know that there's a ton they can do about it other than, than discourage it. Uh, I don't know that they can stop it. Where I think it'll get interesting is, do you throw a match to help a lesser team make the four seed? because you're more confident you can beat them. I think that's the sort of thing that we'll see. Not like, yeah. let's you know let's throw a bone for our buddy organization right. over there, because I don't know that those relationships really exist. Because uh, that would come from the top, right? That would come mm -hmm. from management. You're into, the players aren't going to make that decision right. on their own. Um, but strategically speaking, I, you, know, you might want to do that at some point, right? Like, if we get to the point where United is the champions from last year, right? But mm -hmm. one, two, three is an opportunity to throw a game to... You got to your gamer's origin to give them the win and keep them out. It could be a map, you know, depending on right. what the timing of all this, it doesn't even have like to look bad. Locked. Right. 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 You can just make sure you win three to one and then you put somebody else in and you're fine. And and that's where I think things are going to get really interesting is, is if, and when do we see that happen? Mm -hmm. Um, 
in tournaments like this, I think it's less likely. Right. But once you start talking about Overwatch League, you're almost a fool not to do it. I mean, that's it's not unheard of in the NFL for a team that's locked to bench their starters, uh, you know. And there's a lot of motivations for how much they'd let them play, when they do it, things like right. that. So that's where I think it might come into play. Um, but yeah, I don't, I don't know. This is one of the first brackets I've seen in Overwatch that makes me think something like that could be a benefit. I mean, just looking at E United at the bottom of this bracket is is hard to hard to stomach, honestly. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, it, you know, so if I was one of those team misfits, one, two, three, Gamers Origins, Giganti, I would do everything in my power to keep them there. And if that meant suffer a loss to, you know what I mean, not affect yeah. your seating, like, of course, I would do that in a heartbeat. Right. I mean, if you're exactly a misfits, a one, two, three, a, a Gamers Origin, like, yeah, you know, when you play against Singularity, give them a couple maps. Like, right. Get, but I don't know. It's it's. I don't know. Part of me just want because so the the only the only reason I I would think they would frown upon this is because in the Olympics like I don't know either four or eight years ago when I, when I think the not last Olympics the one before or maybe it was last it doesn't matter uh, the like women's badminton team like be, the way the um, the way that the bracket was set up like the Chinese women's brat, badminton team like was incentivized to throw a match and they just very blatantly did like they didn't even like bring their rackets like on the court or they like put them on the ground or something and they got roasted they got roasted and i think even penalized they may have even gotten removed from the tournament for doing that uh because it's like again it's like unsportsmanlike or whatever like the well there's a there's a way to go about it sure and and that's not a good way to go about no. it. There's definitely better ways uh, right. to do it. And and those involve, you know, especially in Overwatch League when they're carrying players 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. Right. Um, you just swap them out because you want to get them live at tournament experience. We right. want to see what we have in them and against the a real opponent. Team. Um, you know, and, and you need to do that stuff to, to make decisions on rosters and things like, like, do you resign these guys? Do you keep them around? Mm-hmm. Do you let them go? Uh, so there's good reasons to do stuff like that as well as nefarious ones and uh, when as long as you can find some way to mix them together right. and give yourself that plausible deniability like you just have to have something to say out loud that doesn't sound <laughs> completely ridiculous <laughs> right in order to justify it it's so, like well well we think they threw the match because their entire starting lineup was using an xbox controller uh so <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but it'll be interesting to see if that happens. Um, I, I don't, I'm not a hundred percent sure how I fall, how I, uh, fall on that side of the coin, but, uh, let's move on to NA. Um, and yeah, so, uh, we saw phase beat renegades four to zero. Uh, we saw rogue, uh, take out immortals three to two. We saw envious, uh, unsurprisingly, um, take out Kungarna 4-0. Uh, here's where the surprises start. We saw Phenergaphy take out Rogue 3-2. Uh, Envision is continuing to carry on their tirade 4-0 versus Renegades. And then FaZe took out Immortals 3-2. Death, what's the, what's the lowdown on these ones? Yeah, so there wasn't, uh, you know, this was either really, really good matches that you should all definitely run to watch or they were stomps and uh, <laughs> you don't got to worry too much about them. So I, the ones that we're going to deep dive into are uh, the Immortals and the Rogue. We're going to look at the FNR GFE versus Rogue. And also we're going to look at, I think, uh, Immortals Phase and Wars. Phase. Yeah, so uh, we'll take a look at basically all the close ones the there. Twos. It was either 3-2 yeah. or 4-0. <laughs> Yeah, and we're also going to look at 1-2-3 versus the United a little closer. So I don't really have anything to add here other than, uh, you know, Kungarna didn't win a map. And I think that's really telling. You know, they were a team that was undefeated going into this stage in the bracket, you know, before this weekend. Uh, So I think we didn't necessarily expect them to beat Envy, but I would have loved to have seen them have a game mode or have some way, you know, some map or something that they were able to pull out to to get a win, and they just weren't able to do it. And, uh, you know, Envy is really the one team that hasn't either surprised or disappointed anybody in this tournament. They're just rolling out their weird compositions. They're playing junk rat because they don't care. Uh, you know, they're, they're doing whatever they want to do and it's working for them. So not really any, any big takeaway from it uh, because I, I don't think we really put Kungarna on their level yet. 
Um, but I, I had my, sure. yeah, yeah. I had my eye on it just to see, you know, are you able to, um, to, to get a game? Is there an opening Is any window at all for them to be able to take them down? And I didn't, I didn't see it. So if anybody's going to beat envy in this tournament, I don't think it'll be Congarna is basically the takeaway I got from that match. Right. I mean, it, it, I think, you know, looking at the results, sure. You probably don't, we probably don't gain much off of it, but going into it, it like you said, could they take some game modes off of it? Could they make it even close? You know, wh- how far up the ladder is Kungarna? And how? F- and, and by proxy, how far up the ladder is the rest of NA to Envious? Because right now, I mean, if you asked us a couple months ago, it was Envious, Rogue, and then the rest of the pack. And now it's like Envious and who knows what else envious way atop at like triple s tier and then way down the ladder we've got some a tier teams uh and it's actually kind of a, a toss-up right now but like envision envision is the closest to right. who in a million well, years would have thought that thing, going in though, here's the thing though it's it's the same thing i said last week is that if kungarna and envision had their had their uh uh schedules flopped we might be saying the same exact thing about Kungar- uh, kungarna that we're saying about envision right now like if uh if in- if kungarna beats rogue first we're talking about kungarna if envision loses to envy first we're not talking about envy anymore so i'm i'm still waiting to see how envision goes against envious until i really make the judgment however <laughs> They have proven themselves, at least in some capacity. They're winning the matches that they're supposed to win, and they're doing it rather handily, as we saw them take out Renegades 4-0. So uh, it, it, I think the – obviously, I mean, it, it's it's a foregone conclusion, but it's pretty obvious right now that the the match to watch, the match everyone wants to see right now is Envision versus Envious. Yeah, I would even take Envision. I mean, Envision's basically – it's hard to claim they've had a super easy schedule, right? And they, and they really, they just haven't, right? Because they've had Immortals and uh, Rogue on the on the schedule so far and, and managed wins against them. Um, but I just don't know that uh, they've caught them at the right time, right? Like, they, they caught them at times when they weren't playing well. And, you know, they granted that's for Rogue at the moment, and really for both of them, we're not really sure where they stand. But I, I don't know. It feels like they've had an easy schedule from watching it but when you look at the the match history that that's really not the case so i i think honestly with how good phase has looked i think phase versus envision might be the better match but i still want that measuring stick for envision like i want to know how sure. crazy and how hopeful i need to get about them because even a 3-1 loss to envy could really say a lot like i mean yeah. we said we were looking for kungarna to show one weakness cracking the armor just prove that when you face them in the finals or in the in the playoffs that you just need to be on a on fire that day to take them down uh, and then everything gets a lot more compelling we we need to see that we've seen phase expose a weakness and take a map off envy uh but i need to see more than one team able to do it before i think this this bracket's probably just the rest of the brackets for show right well one last thing I'll point out before we do uh, the deep dive is that if you took this, if you took the current standing, so we have uh, NV3-0, Envision 3 Phase 3-1, Kungarna 2-1, Rogue 2-2, FNRG FE 1-2, Immortals 0-4, Renegades 0-4. If you took this uh, lineup and flipped it on top of itself... <laughs> And, and with the exception of Envy being at the bottom, and look, you could you could see this being completely reversed like four months ago, like yeah. Renegades and Immortals fighting to see who's at the top of the bracket. FNRGFE didn't exist at the time, and Rogue wouldn't have been in; uh, they would have been either in EU or whatever. But you get my point: is that like, what in the world has happened to Renegades and Immortals? Like, what is well, going on? Renegades has always been really streaky, and I don't know they that were I've always good at one point. They they were, but I mean they're never good for long, right? Never even throughout the course of an entire tournament. So I'd be really surprised to see Renegades sitting at an undefeated mark as of now. Uh, but at the same time, you know, not not too surprised either, because that's part of being streaky, right? You're going to have matches, you know, tournaments where you're 0-4. You're going to have tournaments where you're 4-0. It just all depends. Uh, and and really, you know, for their sake, they just commit to Fire Mercy already. Like, can you just let Mangachu do what he does? Stop <laughs> making him play Diva. He's good at it, but your team isn't good when he's not clicking on Farah. Uh, you need somebody making superhuman plays, not solid 
zone controlling diva plays. Right. Um, and but yeah, like you said, I mean, it wouldn't wouldn't we wouldn't blink an eye at all, right? It would just be completely normal to see everything flipped on its head, except for envy at the bottom. That would be right, the only weird thing. Um, um, so this this whole bracket's been crazy on the NA side, and I can't wait to see it continue. Yeah. Uh, and and the other thing, I mean, like how much how much stock do you want to put in your diva players right now? And like having your diva players play diva too. Like obviously you want to win the tournament you're in, but diva changes. Like it's going to happen. Diva is not going to be the linchpin of Overwatch like she is right now. But that is neither here nor there. Let's move on and do a little bit of deep dive and let death oh, let's break, it down. break it down. Um, so what match do you want to start with? Uh, we might as well start with EU and look at United versus one, two, three. Uh, and really with this, this was the three, one of the results that we're going to talk about. This is the one that was uh, three to one. So they started things off on Lee Jang tower. One, two, three was able to take that, uh, you know, Honestly, they, they did a good job on Garden. You know, there was some really good picks from Boombox for United. Uh, they were able to take control first, and, and really they never never let it go. So they, they got out to a really strong start and were able to take the first point, and, and it looked like United might have been a little bit back in action. Uh, unfortunately, though, after a very back-and-forth night market, uh, they just had, like, really, really strong... Uh, overtime stalls, and they were able to reinforce fights very, very well uh, throughout the night market phase, and they were able to take that one. Then they came back, and, and really it was the same thing on Control Center. So a really, really close-fought uh, Control matchup there uh, on Li Zhang Tower goes to 1-2-3. Uh, we move things over into Eichenwald, and you know, Boombox, again, just really got a lot of really good picks and held off for quite some time. Uh, you know, they, they were able to take the point one, two, three was in the end, and then they kind of rolled right through the streets phase. So really no defense from one, two, three there. And United C9 really hard. There was a lot of really bad C9s <laughs> in this, in this weekend. Uh, they C9 really hard trying to cap the second point and, and kind of gave that one up. So I think they left a little bit on the table there and had an opportunity to try to take that map as well. So from a really close, really well contested control to kind of giving up and punting a little bit on the, on the second map was a little tough to watch. Um, but moving to Volskaya, uh, United really, they won this map. This is the one they got and they cruised through. They had a five minute time advantage after the reset on Volskaya. So uh, both teams were able to capture, but again, five minutes versus any amount of time doesn't really matter anymore. Uh, and United was able to take that one out. And then Gibraltar comes along and one, two, three, just continually baited out these deep dives uh, from E United. They were going like beyond the checkpoint into the into the hangar phase mm. and go, just going way too deep trying to get these kills. And it, they were just able to like one two three was just able to leave one person back to defend the point and just stall it out right while the the people that dove too deep and got mm. out of line of sight of their healers got mopped up and then they came back and took it over. And it it happened a, a few times there and I just thought it was a little surprising to see United go that hard. Uh, I think teams need to I mean it's an objective based shooter play the point right, right take the there's one guy there so you send one guy to dive super deep that's fine like let your tracer get lost back there and, and attract two people um, but there, you need to use that numbers advantage then or at least at some point come back. Right. Don't keep mm -hmm. chasing until you die. Retreat, come back and then take the numbers advantage you have on the point um, and, and use that as a way to capitalize. And they really didn't do that. The, the people that dove deep ended up getting killed. Uh, so they, they kind of lost that map as well. And how much of that do you think is them trying to play above their pay grade to try to impress people for Overwatch League? You know, I don't know that it was really that just so much as maybe like a, just a little bit of panic. Um, mm. You know, they're they're facing defeat in a match that, you know, they couldn't afford to lose. Right. They're currently on or winless, aren't they? Um, yeah, they're 0-3 in this mm -hmm. bracket right now. And they've got the by far the best map score. Like there's still been a competitive team. But I, I think they panicked a little bit and they knew how important this match win was and how how drastically it would affect uh, the the standings and you know how much of it would affect their chances of making it into the playoffs mm -hmm. and i think they just punted it a little bit to be perfectly honest with you um surprising to see you know it's it, this is the old reunited roster we've been talking about them for how long mm -hmm. uh you know it's the bulk of it at least is still the same so uh, it's been a lot of a, a lot of fun to watch them but this tournament they just they don't seem to have it together and i, I don't know why as a whole this is a problem, but I think in this particular instance, uh, it was just a little bit of nerves and, and just knowing that they had to do it now or never. 
just kind of led them to collapse a little bit on there. And, and yeah, and they ended up getting full held. Uh, and anytime you full hold a map, you should win it in professional Overwatch. The rest of it almost just doesn't matter. So yeah, uh, United sits at 0-3 and 1-2-3 and at 3-0. and And they're just one map behind Misfits. So I've been talking about it since they really kind of broke out in season yeah. zero of, of uh, contenders. It, it, this is a team on the rise looking to really stake a claim and, and carve out their spot in the competitive scene. And it looks like they're doing that uh, really at the expense of anybody and everybody. So mm-hmm. keep an eye out for Misfits and 1-2-3. That looks like it's definitely going to be shaping up to be one hell of a matchup. So I'm very excited to see that one. A preview of the finals, if you will. Potentially, yeah. We'll see well, how the brackets look. I assume one and two should be on opposite ends of the bracket because uh, mm-hmm. they're not going to reset, right? They're going to seed based off standing. So uh, that should so. give them an opportunity. And, and I personally, I mean, obviously they're not going to both escape undefeated, but I would be very, very surprised uh, to see anything other than them at one and two of the bracket, no matter how it shakes out. Moving on, though, uh, we can take a look at the NA matchups a little bit. The first one I want to talk about is FNRGFE versus Rogue. This one went the way of FNRGFE and was really, really, uh, not really, really surprising, but it just, I mean, Rogue looked like they've been in trouble, and I, I think I've been more on the panic mode for Rogue than a lot of people <laughs> have been lately, but uh, I, I think this just really only solidifies that they need to get things in order. And I don't know what it was, but it really seems to have coincided very, very closely with their trip to Korea. They mm-hmm. did not do well in Korea. They came back, had some mixed bag performances, mm-hmm. and you know they had some really good ones. I think they left kind of early in a tournament once, um, won another LAN or something like that. Yeah. But for the most part, after that, they've they've really been uh, in disarray. And we're, we're seeing it here because they are not... Uh, not doing too well, two and two, and currently if the season at, or the group stage ended today, they would not make the cut. So they're on the outside looking in. Uh, and this was their first match of the weekend. They did play twice this weekend, uh, but they started off on Oasis, and really it was just all it was like one big point of two fights, right? There was not a whole lot going on in this. A lot of really good stalling and reinforcing, and FNR GFE was able to use that to their advantage, and just, it just ended up taking that point. Uh, they moved over to University, and this is where I think Rogue really kind of screwed up, just strategically, not even play style wise. It rolled out Sombra versus Sombra, and this is the point where the big health pack in the middle mm-hmm. of the pit. Um, so Sombra versus Sombra is really popular here, and FNR GFE won the fight downstairs and was able to hack the Mega first, which pushed Rogue off of the Sombra. Uh, but what they did was they they kept running Zen, right? And even at the beginning, like they kept the Sombra for a while, hoping to get it again, because all you got to do is take a fight, and then you can get the right. pack again. Uh, so they did keep it for a little while, but they ran two supports with their Sombra, and, and uh, FNR GFE did not. And one of those supports was Zen. I don't mind running two supports, but let's not bring Zen Yadas to Sombra fights, people. Like, he's, his <laughs> HP goes to 25. Uh, I will roll him out in a map. I suspect somebody to play Sombra. And but if I get picked or once if I don't have my uh, trans to line up with the EMP and if I can't cancel that first EMP, I'm off of it. And I don't really recall them switching. Uh, so <clears throat> in a fight where FNR GFE was able to get EMP just about every single fight, I don't know why they continued to run a Zenyatta there. And uh, I think that really was kind of the edge. And that, that was, in my mind, why FNR GFE won the map that and taking the first point. Right. Because that was obviously super important. Uh, from there, the map went to Numbani, and this is a very big rogue map. Uh, they're well known for being pretty good on Numbani, and that being one of their favorite maps. Uh, they lost the first map, so they got to choose it. Uh, they had a really strong dive attack, Rogue did. Uh, they had a Lucio Anna on the dive, though. They did. They left the Zen at home, and uh, they were able to finish out the map with 204 remaining, and Phenergraphy was not able to finish the map at all. So they, they fell just a little bit short. Uh, Rogue took that map down. And Volskaya went the way of FNR GFE. Uh, Rogue did a really good job stalling on defense. Uh, they used an EMP, though, in a failed attempt to retake the first point, and then they didn't have it for point two and got quick capped, and FNR GFE was able to pull it out with 339. So that's a situation where, I mean, if we're looking at what's causing Rogue to falter and what's giving them a problem, I think we really need to look at just their communications, right? The way they're yeah. they're using their ultimates, the way they're listening to their shot caller. Might be the shot caller's fault. They might be listening to them fine. We'll never know. And just the, the calls are right and the reactions are wrong, or the calls are mm-hmm. wrong and the reactions are right. I don't know. Uh, but that was a... a 
ambitious at best EMP, and it left them basically naked for the second point, and it was just quick capped. Uh, Rogue was able to complete uh, the map, however, on their attack, but they did not have any time remaining. Uh, so uh, only one tick was needed on point one, and FNR GFE was able to take that down no problem. So good job stalling and just playing general defense by Fenergothy there. Uh, and Gibraltar was the last map. And the decider, if FNRGFE was able to take it, it was on Gibraltar. Uh, Rogue actually held the second point until the last few seconds. Uh, so they were able to keep uh, FNRGFE from completing the map. Uh, they ran the two support and the Sombra comp much better here. Like they weren't facing a Sombra, so it worked out really, really well. And I get why they like that composition. They just needed, to, they just didn't have to react to the opponent this time. Mm. Uh, so it made a lot of sense and it looked really good. That was mostly in the streets phase they were playing that comp. Uh, so not a place that I've seen a lot of Sombra action. And so I thought it was really, really fun to see that there and very interesting. You know, we see usually Sombra replacing a support, not supplementing your supports. Uh, so it, it, interesting to see a different take on the somber composition uh, from Rogue there. And they were able to take that map, um, just basically did a better job diving uh, for the most part than uh, FNR GFE was able to do on the map. So the tiebreaker then goes to Ilios, and it was just a 2-0 win there by Fenergothy. Uh, they started out on Ruins, and it was this Sombra versus Sombra and Widow versus Widow uh, compositions here. So they mirrored each other really, really strongly. And I don't know that I've seen a lot of Sombra on Ruins. I like the packs for it. They're fairly cent you know central in the map and close to the point. So uh, it's definitely something I can't wait to try out more. Uh, especially since both teams did it. Like there's something to this in scrims that they're mm -hmm. seeing that we haven't seen in tournaments yet. Uh, but it basically boiled down to me is, is Bud's got opening picks on AKM and just kind of ran from there. I don't know the exact percentages. Uh, my notes are, are just highlights, not not uh, comprehensive information. <laughs> um, but FNR GFE won that one. And then on Well, uh, they just went with Bud's and and, uh, and the Fair Mercy combo and they won it big. Um there was a big, big res there that sealed the win. That was on well. Uh, so a really good job uh, by FNR GFE sealing that map and, and sealing the upset there. Yeah. I'm, I'm wondering, you know, how much of this, you know, the, 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 the errors you pointed out from Rogue were errors that were because they did not adapt appropriately mm -hmm. to the situation or they made a bad call and it, they weren't able to adapt to the call. One of, one of the best pieces of advice I've ever <clears throat> been given in a game is don't mess up just because you messed up. Um, you can make a wrong call and just follow through as though that was the right call. Do it, you know, adjust to that. Don't, don't, you know, oh, I did this, so I have to keep continuing on, like, and, and doing things wrong. Don't mess up just because you messed up. You can, you can fix yourself after that and it seems like rogues not being able to do that and it kind of makes sense they were so dominant with dive comp for that you know one to two month period where they were just running the same comp everyone else was and they were doing it better so they never really had they just they're very one trick pony kind of almost like ninjas in pajamas where it's like you know we're gonna do the best thing because we started it or we we perfected it first we're gonna do it better than you and mm -hmm. the other strategies are just subpar to it. We never have to adjust because if you do something else, you're going to be worse. And if you do this, you're also going to be worse. That's why we're running everything. Now, you know, the, like you said, the maps where it was dive versus dive, Rogue was doing pretty well. Um, when there were maps where they had a wrench thrown into it and they really, from a strategy standpoint, should have switched off of, of uh, their, their main strategy – they weren't able to adjust. They just are not used to it. It, it kind of makes sense. Uh, you know, it's the type of thing where I would imagine you would try other things in scrims, but you know, I, I'm not in there. I'm not, I'm not their team manager. I'm not the one that's practicing with them. So I, it, it'd be interesting to talk with someone who has insight uh, into rogues, you know, kind of practice strategy and see, you know, what they think about their, about their results. Hey, Smith, get on it. Um, <laughs> I, didn't yeah, wanna, and, uh, <laughs> I didn't want to allude too heavily, but. <laughs> um, yeah, and honestly, I, you know, going into this match and this weekend, I was much more worried about Rogue than I am leaving it, right? Because I think their mistakes are pretty small, and I think they're fixable. Uh, so long term, sure. I and mean, in the scope of this tournament, I don't know that they've, they, they very well might have done too much damage to recover, but mm -hmm. I have a feeling if they 
play well and play strong, they can get their wins over Kungarna. Uh, they still have to play uh, envious, so that might be a bit of a tr- bit of problems, right? Like you they can't be having envious any before. problems. They have, but you can't beat Envious right now the way they're playing when you're not at your best. Like, right. there's no way in my mind that the Rogue from this weekend can do much more than maybe a 3 1 loss sure. against Envious the way they've been playing sure. this weekend. But it's the thing with these long tournaments, it's going to change. And, and these mm-hmm. teams, you know, they talked about it on the cast mm-hmm. a little bit this weekend about some of these teams and players don't really turn up and, and, and get into their final form uh, until halfway through the tournament. Mm-hmm. And we've seen teams like Renegades kind of go the opposite way, right? Like they're <laughs> they're usually good super early in a tournament yeah. and then tail off later. Or even in a match, you can see it too. Yeah. Like by, by round five, they're they're dead on their feet. And, and it's it's really funny for a, and it, that to be a thing in a game. But um, I do get it. Like usually it's like, oh, your conditioning is not good enough. Right. You can't. <laughs> but well, in, in, in an eSport, that's not going to be the case. Yeah. Um, but even just maybe your attention span, I don't know. Maybe they should just do marathon scrims in their schedules to push them past it. I really don't know. <laughs> but I do think Rogue is going to be fine in the long run. Um, but we'll sure. see. You know, They're currently on the outside looking in. So if Kungarna and FaZe and Envision, if nobody slips, they're not going to make it. So we'll have to wait and see. Uh, there should be Rogue matchups against, like I said, FaZe and Kungarna going forward. Uh, so those will be very, very important to Rogue. You know, I, I would I also wouldn't be surprised if there's, you know, one or two players on Rogue that are just burnt out and are just there for the, the rest of the team and they're not putting forth that you know, maybe it's not that they're not trying necessarily, they're just not as enthused about it as the rest of the team. And if yeah. not everyone is a hundred percent, uh even if they're not actively being negative, it is not helpful for the team so i'm just complete i'm i'm just speculating entirely i know nothing about yeah right. until there's the insider workers. inside reporters and locker rooms and things like that everything right. is just kind of guesswork so that's really all that we can do um but let's look forward here because i do want to talk about the match that they won this weekend mm-hmm. as well yeah. and i want to talk about them against immortals and that one started out uh on lijang tower uh we had night market as the first map really really back and forth doomfist versus doomfist uh kareev got uh, in, in the last fight, really just got this huge pick, right, that just ended the fight before it started. So uh, really, really good job. His Zenyatta is out of this world, and his aim in general is just out of this world. He flexes the Widow. We've seen them in this match run uh, four DPS compositions. Like, I mean, they they gotten a little crazy uh, with what they're willing to do uh, with Kareev, and I love seeing it as somebody in that role. By all means, uh, uh, Finale, tell me to learn Widowmaker, and I'll do it. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, really, really back and forth uh, match there on Night Market. But Kareev kind of just stood on his head right there with one kill, ended the map uh, for Immortals. So good on them. Uh, Control Center, however, went the way of Rogue. They 100 to 0 it. Uh, really only uh, cough point that they play well, kind of looking at this tournament here. <laughs> Going into this match, they had not won a single King of the Hill round uh, wow. in this tournament. So uh, definitely looked like Rogue's biggest weakness. But they were able to take Control Center, but I do think they've won Control Center every time they've been on it on Leech and Power. I think I caught that from the broadcast. However, so tied one to one, and now it's best of three for for competitive and for this tournament uh, on King of the Hill. So mm-hmm. now they move to Garden, and Rogue decidedly wins the point uh, to take their first cough map of the season. So good on them to finally get that uh, you know over the hill here and, and off their backs, especially in a tournament where the tiebreaker gets played on control. It's really, really bad to be bad on control. That's probably the worst game mode to have as a weakness. Um, but we go on to the next map, and Immortals gets to pick. And Immortals, what are you doing? You don't take Rogue to Numani, okay? <laughs> News flash, it's their best map. Uh, you don't want to take them there under any circumstances. But they did, and they paid for it. Uh, they were yeah, not able to finish silly. the map. They gave up. Rogue gives up the first and the second. And they just had kind of poor positioning, Rogue did, and, and they just got picked uh in the, I'm sorry, in the last fights on the point, like they did a good job stalling things. Uh, Immortals ran this attack tracer on Numbani. Guys, if you play on a team, even if you're solo queuing in quick and quick play and comp, please stop playing tracer on Numbani. Uh, <laughs> it's a pet peeve of mine. She's not very good. She's got a hard time getting to the high ground. Like you have no blinks left by the time you're even safely anywhere. Uh, and you just have a really hard time gaining that high ground. Try out Doomfist. Just take your dive comp, run Doomfist instead of the Tracer. I think you'll have a much better time of it. Um, but nonetheless, you know who else ran Attack <laughs> Attack Tracer? 
robe. Uh, unfortunately, <laughs> it's driving. It's literally driving me nuts. I don't understand why people do this. Uh, and it went poorly for a good little while there. But unfortunately, uh, they were just able to push the defenders off the high ground, right? And then the tracer wasn't completely useless. So uh, they managed. To, both teams did manage to cap with the tracer on their team. Um, Rogue, however, was just able to finish out the map. Um, actually, they quick capped it there. Yeah, Tracer was on the ground, never even attempted to gain the high ground, but the tanks went up and just knocked all the defense down to the ground. So it was a very quick point one cap, didn't really go poorly for them, but they knew what they needed to do with the Tracer in order for it to be successful, right. so it worked. Uh, don't try to send your Tracer in around the back, up the top, on the, you know, up to the high ground. Right. She's not going to get there in time. The soldier's going to keep her out uh, or hurt her so bad she's going to die as soon as she, she comes out onto the point. Um, and a great, great second uh, point defense by Immortals. They ate up like three to four minutes, uh, but unfortunately it just wasn't enough. You know, they, they didn't even have to complete the map. They just had to come pretty darn close, mm -hmm. uh, and, and Rogue was able to get that up. So Rogue is now up, uh, let's see, two to zero here and, and just kind of cruising. So um, looked very much so like they rebounded. Again, questionable map pick by Immortals, and that I think was a bigger problem than choosing to play Tracer on the map. Uh, was just don't take teams to their best maps. They're they're most comfortable there. Unless you on you have to really, really believe that you're a better team on that point and on that map. And I don't think anybody can say that about Rogue. I'm not even sure Envy can say that about Rogue. Uh, but hopefully we'll know that soon. Uh, Hanamura went the way of Immortals here. Uh, it was just a really, really strong attack. It was Doomfist versus Doomfist, and Agilities won that one out. Uh, Rogue was able to complete, but they had no time left on the clock when they did it, and that meant Immortals only needed to get the one tick on the first point on the reset. Uh, guys, it is super, super important to finish with one second left on the clock and give you a reset. Uh, we've seen maps and, and whole, t you know, um, sorry, maps and matches decided uh, by just the sheer fact that you can quick cap with one minute or you can extend overtime for a million years on payload with one minute because it will give you that if you just have one second left on the mm -hmm. clock. But when you zero out and that's it, it's so easy on 2CP to take the first point, let alone only needing one tick on it. Mm -hmm. And with, they have, uh, let's see here. Uh, I didn't write down how much time they had, uh, but they had plenty. You know, it was a, a very, very solid attack uh, by Immortals. So they had probably, I'd say, in the area of three to four minutes left. Mm -hmm. That's not much time. Or that's plenty of time to take one tick on an easy point to capture. And moving on, we go to Gibraltar. Immortals also takes this one, which will force the, the fifth map. Rogue had the advantage uh, after the reset. Uh, by a large margin, and Immortals c 9 super hard on the second attack after the reset. <laughs> like, just was about to capture the first point and left for no reason. Uh, so Rogue <laughs> with a huge time advantage and Immortals appearing to punt should have just breezed through it, but they were not able to. Immortals full held and managed to hold that map. I thought that was really, really impressive. Um, showed a lot of mental toughness, right? Like, to mm -hmm. make a mistake like that and just kind of appear to throw, like, they would have been halfway through the second point, I, I really believe, if they would have just stayed on it. Um, teams just need to, you don't need to your diva just has to die, okay? When the self-destruct is on the point and you're in overtime, your diva has to lose her mech. Just leave her there, please. Uh, that needs to not even be something that needs called. Your diva mm -hmm. needs to know that's her job. Um, but going forward, we move to Ilios for the tiebreaker. Again, can Rogue manage to take out two Koth maps in one series when they hadn't won one in the entire tournament so far? They did it, and it was a nail-biter. It was super, super close, uh, but it, it really gives them a lot of hope, and I think gives Rogue fans a lot of hope they might be able to bring this back. They have to get over their cough problems. They have to be able to win that game mode, even if not regular. Just get to 50-50 with it. You know, that's that's roughly where you need to be to have a puncher's chance, mm -hmm. and being at 0% wasn't going to cut it. Uh, so I think it's it's telling that, you know, they, they were able to get past this, and against the mortals of all teams, not an easy, not an easy uh, feat or accomplishment there. No, I mean, let's see. What? Who else does Rogue have to play the rest of this tournament? Envious, uh, Renegades, huh. Kungarna, and FNRG. No, they no, Rogue aren't played Phase? that. In Face, yep. so they need to play um, two. No, they need to play three of the four teams in the top half of the bracket right now to finish out the series. So it is definitely going to be telling. Um, you know, is Rogue actually still the contender, uh, pun intended, that they once were? Are they still a 
top three team in NA or, you know, have they, you know, gone the way of so many other once glorified uh, NA, right. NA uh, Overwatch teams? Who knows? Um, yeah, and that matchup against Kungarna really, in my mind, has a, a very serious chance to just decide the group. Yeah. Uh, or at least the fourth spot, you know, mm-hmm. it, it really has a chance to solidify things. So uh, I definitely, you know, keep that one uh, circled as well. And FaZe is just so strong right now that I think mean, them playing against anybody that's known, even whether they're slumping or anything, the only one I don't really care about seeing them against is Renegades until they get <laughs> until they get it together. Uh, Renegades is is a bit of uh, a disappointment in this tournament, and I don't, I personally don't see that changing. I think the roster kind of knows they're not going into the overwatch league as a team as a six-man right. group uh so now it becomes stand out and make plays and, and guys you played with mangachu for quite some time so please let him get some more time on ferris so that he can show off and, yeah. and uh you know make some waves there but we do have one more i want to talk about uh, i will try to keep it quick uh it is phase versus immortals it was just one of the friday matchups uh so this is a rematch of the uh season zero quarterfinal and that went 3-0 in favor of Immortals, so kind of a sign of, of how things have changed. We've already told you the results, so I can tell you uh, FaZe does go ahead and win that one, but it does take five. So they start out on Nepal, and this is Doom Dive versus Regular Dive. Immortals uh, and Agilities is running the Doom Fist. Uh, FaZe takes that one on the back of zero meteors from agilities and two <laughs> dragon blades from shadow burn uh so when those players are really in my mind what this matchup boils down to can agilities keep up with shadow burn can they shut shadow burn down etc uh and in this point here they were definitely not able to do so um so let's see yeah, next is Sanctum, a really really back and forth a narrow narrow victory there for immortals uh and then I forgot to write down who won it, but I should be able to just deduce it from looking at things here. Well, anyways, they go on to Village. Uh, it was an 80% for Immortals to start. They used uh, an unnecessary trans. Uh, they lost on the next fight, unfortunately, but they were able to recap and hold. Uh, so Immortals goes ahead and takes that map down. They go over to King's Row. Uh, they have kind of this Doomfist death ball. I'm just going to call it Doom Ball from now on for FaZe. Uh, versus the, this is where uh, Kareev goes a little crazy and heads over to the sniper. Uh, they were four DPS with one tank and one healer. Hmm. Um, so this was a Doomfist dive comp with both of the back, like all three of the backliners, Doomfist, Tracer, Genji, and then Widowmaker as well. They quick capped really, really bad. And what happened here was... Uh, Wait, I don't know that this is the, the right spot. Anyway, so they yeah, they quick capped and they move really, really far into point two. Um, they eventually switched up their composition and they go to this Reinhardt Zarya Tracer Genji combo. So you've got like the dive DPS with your death ball tanks, and it didn't really make much sense, but they took point two anyways with it as soon as they switched to it. Uh, but then it stalled out and they went into this Tracer Doomfist composition, which is much better. Um, Doomfist isn't a diver, he's very capable of standing behind his Reinhardt tank and just punishing anybody that decides they want mm-hmm. they want to try to contest it or go anywhere near the back line so i thought that was a lot better but unfortunately uh, they were not able to take uh point three on phase's attack however uh phase gets picked uh, they get a pick really really early right and immortals runs back to try to group up uh and then just last second take the first point uh, they already knew getting a tick or whatever didn't matter they just needed to stall for as much time as possible they don't get back in time. They actually let the point go for free off one kill, huh. but they're trying so hard to get back, they're right there, and then they get wiped anyways. So FaZe is able to just kind of roll through. Um, let's see, they, they really never get stopped or anything uh, until the second point uh, right before it. And then the same thing kind of happens, right? Like FaZe goes for a dead eye and Immortals backs up to retreat off of it, and then FaZe just pushes the point, and nobody ever comes in. Like, guys, your D.Va has to die. I don't know how many times to tell you your D.Va has to die in these situations at the end of the point. It's okay to lose a mech. It's much better than losing a point with no time. Like, yeah, you, even if you're going to lose the fight as a result of the ultimate, that's fine. Just take as much time off the clock. Don't just give it up for free. Uh, so that was a really, really kind of ugly situation there for Immortals. Uh, and as a result, FaZe goes ahead and takes that map. They didn't have to full complete, so they were they were able to finish out. Um, they had like two minutes and 30 seconds left on the clock, too. So it was a pretty handy, uh, you know, handedly victory. 
saying that terribly, but anyways. <laughs> You're um, saying it dramatically better than anyone dr- could Dramatically ever. better. Uh, next map was Dorado. That one went to Immortals. It was Die versus Dive. FaZe ran the Ana. It was really the only difference in the comps. Um, Immortals takes the, the first point in just two quick fights, and FaZe does a really good job of slowing them down and stalling them, but literally throughout the entire map, FaZe does not win an entire point or an entire team fight. Uh, so it was just kind of really awkward. Uh, and it's okay to do the stall they did. Like the stall they did is really, really good, but there needs to be like two team fight wins where you mm-hmm. really slow them down and completely stop them. Uh, you got to do more than just slow them down. And then, uh, there was an, a phenomenal defense by immortals. Phase got just shut down and smothered on point one by a somber defense. Uh, and on Dorado, that's another place I really hadn't seen somber before. Uh, so it was a lot of fun to see that. It uh, gives you another comp to try if you are like me and on a team and like like to try to mirror these ridiculous things you see these teams doing. Uh, then they take the tiebreaker here over to Ilios, uh, and this was uh, on well. It was a pharmacy duel, uh, a really, really long first cap here, like an epic. Both teams resurrected in the fight uh, before the point got taken. It was won by FaZe. Uh, they then spent like way too many alts trying to defend, um, so they, they lost the point right after that, but they were able to recap and win that one. Uh, it was 192 at the end. Mm. Uh, basically another situation where Immortals just kind of chased down kills too much. Like They just wanted to, to finish what they were doing and win their one-on-one so bad uh, that they didn't retreat to the point, and, and they just got caught out and, and eventually lost the point, and that one was, was really close. Uh, so I thought just a little more discipline from Immortals there might have flipped that point. And then on Lighthouse, uh, it was FaZe running Pharmacy versus Immortals running a Doomfist comp. Uh, FaZe gets to 99-0 before Immortals manages to take the point. However, Immortals failed to play the point on Lighthouse and got back capped. And because it it was, yeah, and then they just instantly ended. Like, they were were just, again, chasing kills, trying to go find these people because they needed to to get picks to win the fights decidedly, but they never sent anybody to the point and just (laughs) lost it right away. So kind of a boneheaded move there. Um, Immortals seemed a little out of sorts, and I think that it's just kind of, it's really surprising to me. The teams that we're seeing have these goofy problems, right? These communication breakdowns, Mm -hmm. uh, good song. But, um, yeah, the teams that are having these communication breakdowns are the teams that I would have least expected it from. I I mean, Rogue and Immortals. Immortals has been successful not on individual talent and play skill alone. They've done it on communication, on these exact things that now are are biting them. And it used to be a strength, and now it seems to be a weakness. So, to me, that's even more disconcerting than Rogue uh, for Immortals. And, And a really bad time for the roster to be doing this. Well, their organization already bought their team for the league. They're in. Right. Uh, so, like, just do what? Like, are they going to go sign somebody else? When if you're there and one of the top teams in NA, I don't they think might. so. I they think they're going to. They might now, but I don't. I think <laughs> if Immortals came out and was four and zero right now because they hadn't faced Envy yet, uh, they might. We might have had the announcement that they signed already. So. Yeah. Well, that's uh, I guess the beauty of contenders, right? Like, it's where you make or break yeah but one thing that's not on the show notes so i'm just going to run in and mention it now that belongs in this section of the show where as you can tell we're playing with the formatting a little bit getting ready for the league um we've talked about doing like a recap episode and a preview episode and maybe splitting things up a little differently uh but one thing we do need to mention because it was a it was big big news uh there was a bit of a bidding war over sinatra ah yes it was our first individual player signing for overwatch league signs for 150 thousand dollars blevins the 17 year old will make how many times more than both of us combined uh some number two or greater um so uh yeah so nrg really lands the first big fish here i think it was really really telling that there's a bit of a bidding war over this guy but in my mind this breaks down to one hundred and fifty thousand dollars for a tracer main like he's a one trick. He's a phenomenal one trick. I don't. It's one of those times when I say something that's often used as an insult, but I don't mean yeah. it as an insult. Like if there's ever a hero that you can get away with one tricking on, it's Lucio. But if there's another one, <laughs> it's it's Tracer. Yeah. Uh, so I think it's it's really really interesting, and it really sets the stage. Now we don't know the the player salaries for all of Lunatic High going to the South Korea team. Right. Um, you know, so we don't know all that information, but we have this one. 
And I think that's a, an interesting mark to set because now I'll just ask you outright somebody with, and I don't want to name names specifically, but somebody with a super, super deep hero pool that can flex to anything, including tracer Genji, all the popular ones think like Siegel's hero pool, but it doesn't have to be him specifically because right. he's got the whole marketability right, right. standpoint to drive up his cost. But um, you know, what do you think that puts a, a really solid, flexible DPS player at? Jeez, it, salary -wise. it's it's tough because I mean, if you're seeing i mean so here's the, here's the first question is sinatra really only a one-trick pony like we've seen him be a one-trick pony but does he add, like can he not also play other things very well he just doesn't it's a it's a really good point but i think the the overall consensus there not that we're right um it and, is and just we're getting we're getting news from a smith that he's not a one trick he it's a top five zero well That's but right. here's what i'm gonna say it's not that he's bad at the other heroes it's that he's so ridiculously good at tracer that why would you have him do anything else? So right. I guess that's a really good point. You know, he's got the flexibility to move, but the meta hasn't forced him to. Right. But I don't know. I to say he's got a top five Zarya, that only matters on ladder, right? Or like on your overbuff stats page. That right. doesn't mean when you get into a tournament setting with a six stack team, you can play it. So I don't know that being able to mechanically pull off a hero is the same thing. Because mechanically, I can pull off a lot more heroes then I think my team would ever in a million years let me play. <laughs> you know, because just because, like, the, the whole team dynamic is so different. Now, these guys are pros. They spend a lot more time in it. They're going to be better at adapting than I am. Right. Uh, I mean, but, I mean, but, if you need to change off of the Tracer to something else that he's also mechanically good at, is that a, is that really a difference? Then I, I think that would almost be... I think, regardless, I think regardless of what you have him switch to, it's a significant downgrade for your team. Not that he's so bad, Adam. What you're but saying I just think he's so is good how much him. do I think Shadowburn is worth versus <laughs> versus Sinatra? Um, I don't know. Shadowburn's a little bit the same thing with Genji, right? Yeah, <laughs> but here's the thing: you can always play Genji. Right. Um, I mean, he's he's shown Farah. He's shown more to me than and and A Smith is bringing up you know the triple tank uh, time that he spent where where he was Zarya and that. Uh, I don't to me. I don't really remember that. It was far enough back at this point. The triple just, tank metas and the rear view mirror. I, I really um, just zonked out for triple tank. I was like, you know, this yeah. we're done here. <laughs> um, um, but yeah, I mean, it's but, so maybe one, calling him a one trick isn't fair, but ooh. I don't know that it's it's super unfair either, right? Like he's going to be the tracer on energy. Like he's going to be playing right. the hit scan, so, DPS, and the dive. We, so I don't know. We also have Thorn Rain bringing up an interesting question. Jake versus Sinatra in salary. Well, I mean, just by virtue of he's been on our show, I think Jake deserves more money. Right. Uh, you know, that's that's just a fact. Is that who we're airing today, by the way? It is not today. No. It's Cool Matt sixty nine. Oh, we already we already aired Jake. That's right. Correct. Okay. So yeah. Cool Matt sixty nine later today. Um, I think that's another player. Like, he's got that super deep hero pool. Now that yeah. he not that he gets to show it. Um, I think there's a lot of people. I don't know. To me, this is going to be like your baseline most expensive player on your roster the 150 grand like that's I, you know, there's no, I don't know if that's true there will be a couple that are more but i think in in average when you look at the I top think player, IDQD I, think makes more than that. I think idqd makes more than that it's possible i don't know it's going to be really interesting to watch there's nothing we can do with this information but I'm speculate playing, wildly I'm, playing, and... I'm paying the plupster way more than that <laughs> i'm I, he's, I... he's one that might be my i mean because his hero pool is as deep as it comes and his talent level on all those heroes, it, I don't notice big drops in, in skill. And I don't remember Sinatra on Zarya, but I feel like I've seen him try like soldier at random times, you know, here and there and yeah. just not been super, super uh, impressed with it. I mean, he's good. There's no way Sinatra's bad at anything he does when he picks up an over uh, an overwatch hero uh, compared to what I'm used to seeing. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I just feel like they're playing him solely as tracer. Like, whether or not he is actually a one trick or not, I feel like they paid for his tracer and his tracer alone. Until we see the roster flesh out, though, who knows? Yeah, time was another one. Oh, uh, yeah. I could see time. It's it's tough. I so forget it's... about him because I would never roster him on my team. But at the same time, <laughs> right. like he's, he's the hands down Terrell the most talented Owens, single Terrell player. Terrell Owens factor. Right. Locker room right. cancer. <laughs> um, so here's the question. It's how much do the how like like thorn rain brought up how much does robert Kraft want to win the first overwatch league how much money are they willing to spend on it 
Like it's really going to depend. Like it's, it's, I think the question is less of how much money will best player on the new England team make and more a question of like what percentage of the total amount of money the team is willing to invest. Are they willing to spend on one player? Yeah. Yeah. It's going to matter, matter a lot on, on roster construction. You know, I, I think cool Matt brought a, a different viewpoint into that seven to 12 roster spot than I, and you guys are going to hear it soon. Um, so I don't want to say too much, but he alluded to the fact that like, that's your maximum. That doesn't mean teams are going to carry 12 people. Um, right. So it, it'll be really telling to see how people want to distribute their money because I don't think a Smith wrong, like 300 K for a time. Who doesn't sound absurd to me. It sounds about right. Um, but at the end of the day, I do think, I mean, there was a bidding war over this guy, this kid, right? And he's kind of like the number one tracer player in NA at the moment. Mm-hmm. Um, when you when you take out the Taimus and the things like that that are in Korea most of the time and from Europe, yeah. uh, I think at the end of the day, he's basically one of the top players on the NA side of things, at least at what he does. There's definitely, I, I don't think there's anybody better on tracer out there than him. I'm comfortable saying that right now. Um, so I don't know. I I think it works out to be a good (laughs) average. Like you're not going to be, there's no way that's the highest salary in my opinion. Um, but yeah, it's, it it would be, if we had a salary cap, this would be a much easier conversation to have. Right. Um, yeah. Uh, I don't even want to get into the, uh, we're definitely not going to do it right now because we still have to air the interview and we're already at over an hour, but the whole salary cap thing. <laughs> we already talked about how we were going to do this, and we did. Um, <laughs> but, um, yeah, I mean, so let's just say there was a salary cap. Uh, I don't know. It, it, that's that's a conversation you can't really have because you need a salary cap figure. Then you need to account for, like, you know, what would you do, like, for a percentage of your salary right. cap to be on a, a position? Like, that's because okay, so that's how they, they view it in the NFL. Right. Like, you want 35% of your salary cap to go to your starting quarterback. Right. You want 10% to go to your running starting running back. Right. You know, things like that. Okay, so. so this is what I'll say. I think Sinatra will not be the highest paid player in Overwatch League. But I do think he's in the top quarter, the top twenty five percent highest. Yeah, yeah. Like I, I, I think we're generally in the in the same ballpark on agreement uh, about where where this falls. But I don't know. It's it's just so hard to imagine that a bidding war happened for the first player, and he's not going to be the biggest money. Like that's a, that's just a weird concept to me because in my mind, the biggest money would go early, right? You. You put your big stones in, and then when you put the little stones in, they can kind of fill in Here's around the it. the other right? thing, but... though. Uh, something that A-Smith brought up in the Discord is that he's 17 right now, and he has to be 18 to be in Overwatch League, so he's actually going to be missing half of the first season. Yeah, I thought it was. I thought seventeen would be okay to play. So I don't want to. I don't want to say that like it's a definitive fact. I mean, I trust A. Smith. Like he's um, always super on the ball about the research. Maybe it was in the article that I skimmed and didn't read. Um, but yeah, I, that's that would definitely factor into the price, right? And uh, it's really interesting. I think it almost guarantees that they're going to extend that contract into a second year, uh, just because if you're only getting half a year out of the guy, you're, you're going to want to get your return on your investment. I mean, unless he drastically underperforms, which I don't think anybody expects. Um, it'll be interesting to see. So we saw, um, who was it? Uh, who was it that put 30 million into, uh, someone put like 20 million into an Overwatch League team spot, something. I don't know. I, it, it doesn't matter. I, I think we'll see, we'll definitely see um, over 150K. I think, so. My maximum price I would see for a player, I think, is probably under. F- it's got to be under five hundred thousand, right? It's got. Oh be. yeah, yeah. I would, I would be surprised to see anybody hit four. Uh, I think three is probably going to be our cap, and that's going to be Taimu with his ridiculous skill, or same thing for Pluppy, basically. Um, Tavik, anybody? That's, I think it might have been a while since we made a Pluppy reference. Uh, he still lives. Uh, Pluppy's alive. Uh, but yeah, anyways, it's going to be really interesting to see because I think it's going to anybody that beats that is going to be, you know, one of those two top flexible players or, you know, Siegel who's super, super flexible and like guaranteed to be the number one Jersey seller. If he's on a roster, mm-hmm. like I think it's just about locked up. There'll be more Siegel jerseys sold than any other kind. Right. 
so, I mean, that means a lot to teams, right? So, yeah. especially since you're not really, there's no Long salary seats. cap, so you're not like overpaying and, and your roster is not suffering as a result. Right. Um, but it, it, it'll make a big difference uh, to, to owners out there for sure. So, I expect. I expect to see him go for more than that. But the list of people that I think should make more than a Sinatra is probably not bigger than five or six. And my it's only that big because I would put some flex support players in there because I have uh, more respect for that position than most people. <laughs> yeah, uh, I think this is this is where it's starting to get the most interesting for me. Like I am going like I really I'm going to enjoy talking about this side of the Overwatch League in the weeks to come. Like, I can't wait till we get another big signing to give us a gauge. It's like, how much does the like all right like support player make? Like, how much? Like, what roles are making the most? Like, um, you know, does a a really good Sombra make a ton of money because Sombra is really good? Like, does it, does it fluctuate based on the meta? Like, that these are the things I want to see happening. And I want to see yeah. I, maybe different teams value different positions more. Like, I think that's super interesting. But that is time for and another. We, before another. we stop, though, yeah. uh, Thorn Rain did let us know that it, it is confirmed. He cannot play. He can sign contracts and stuff. That's where the confusion on my end came in. They're able to sign contracts. They're able to practice with the team. But they cannot actually play or participate in an Overwatch League match until their 18th birthday. Makes sense. Uh, and the last thing we'll say is that A. Smith – can think of 10 Koreans that deserve more money than Sinatra. So no. we'll see. We will certainly see. The question is, I don't, we'll... I don't romanticize all the Korean players personally. I don't know. I think there's other factors there. Um, I think they're hard to market when you bring them over into an NA franchise. Um, I don't know. Maybe. We'll, we'll I don't see. Know. The, that's not, I don't know. I'm sure I undercounted the, or undersold the number of Koreans that, that deserve that much. But to me, <laughs> I think it also just varies in like what we think of the hundred and fifty dollar mark, right? Like the or a hundred and fifty thousand dollar mark. Right. And there's a bit of a discrepancy in whether or not we what me and A Smith think is accurate for, you know, how many people will make more than that, what the price range for these players will be. Right. I don't know. But this is the only one we've got to go on. So and, and the fact that there was a bidding war forces me to assume he's gonna be in that top ten percent of of player salaries. Yeah. Um there's probably a whole nother hour of conversation we could have just on that signing, but we will save that for another time. Any, any last uh, minute stuff before we hop over to the interview death with cool Matt 69, no less. No, my buddy, cool Matt. Don't, don't do it. Cool Matt. You'll get that in a minute. <laughs> Actually, you'll get it in about 40 minutes. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> We're going to pass it over to myself, death blow and cool Matt 69. And then the current future past versions of us will catch up with you in just a second. Thanks, John, and welcome back, everyone. We are delighted here today to welcome Cool Matt 69 to the show, uh, a member of Team USA, and I'm going to mess it up. F N R G F E. Is it? Did I, did yeah. I get it right? Okay. Yes. That's I didn't. Very even, tough, honestly. I didn't even cheat. I just had that in the back of my mind. But welcome to the show, so it's man. Not really phonography. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for having me. You know confirm not phonography yeah no uh i I, i've got to say death blow has been one of your biggest fans for quite some time um i'm the only fan (laughs) well for what it's worth he is a relatively gigantic fan in terms of amount of fanhood and also just actual size so you gotta (laughs) he is the biggest person the end um but enough about us the we we hear enough about us every every uh week sadly but let's just jump right into it and the first question is a pretty easy one but i got to preface it with there's a little bit of a background here so we ask everyone we have on the show what your like gaming or esports or both origin story is and the reason we ask is we have a little bit of a contest and i'll explain more about that later but what is like your how did you get into gaming what is your origin story yeah, um, I mean, I've been playing games, like, all my life, right? Like, everybody else. I think, like, the first FPS I played was, like, late 90s, like, Quake 2 or something. Mm. Uh, like, competitively, uh, I guess. Like, I tried my hand at TF2 a little bit in the early stages. I played a lot of pugs and stuff like that, but never made it too far. Um, 
after that, I kind of jumped from like FPS to FPS, looking for one that would be mm-hmm. successful, where I could like make a career out of it, right? And there was like a weird phase for a lot of players like me that didn't want to play Counter Strike, that but also wanted mm-hmm. to compete in an FPS, and so yeah. we went from like <clears throat> just like random FPS game to FPS game. Like developers would make these promises that they'd support the esports scene and it would grow and stuff like that, and so there was. There was Brink, there was Dirty Bomb, there was Firefall, there was Nazgoth, there was... The list is, like, like it's really long, you know? I call us, like, yeah. FPS refugees or, like, nomads or something. <laughs> we just jump from, like, game to game looking for one that would be successful. And, I mean, I think um, it would take, like, a, a company like Blizzard to actually have the infrastructure and, like, the, the brand to support a new title. And so, you know, once we heard of Overwatch, it was, like, a no-brainer to go to it yeah you really kind of jumped around the uh, fps graveyard uh yeah, re- sure. rest in peace dirty bomb uh that was fun for a hot minute um but yeah so the just for reference the story you were competing against was one of our first guests actually i think it was our first guest ever started playing games because he wanted to challenge a swedish swedish dj at a boys club to a match of Tony Hawk Pro Skater 2, which pretty much makes no crazy. sense whatsoever, but it's, it's yet to be topped. I'm sorry, but uh, no. I Tony mean, Hawk was sick, though. <laughs> it's true. I mean, I, I wish they would just re-release Tony Hawk Pro Skater 2. Like, I don't want I don't want a new one with, like, a, a bunch of updates and, like, stupid, like, microtransactions. I just want Tony yeah. Hawk Pro Skater 2. Not even with the uh, N64 version. No, I, I, that. I only played like the PS1. Like, the best soundtrack. Today. <laughs> oh, I think that was the same. Yeah. Yeah, definitely uh, a great soundtrack on that one. No, I mean, Overwatch has Overwatch has a decent soundtrack, too. Um, uh, honestly, like, I'm really tired of hearing that music. <laughs> like, every match. Well, it's true. I mean, you've got to get... It, it's got to get so. sickening after a while, or maybe you just love it so much. But um, let's move right along and... Talk a little bit about Team USA. Obviously, you've got two huge fans here um, for that. But what is what has it been like getting all the media attention, like the interviews and, and autographs and whatnot? I mean, coming on schmuck shows like this is obviously at the bottom of that list. But um, like, what has the attention been like um, for representing Team USA? What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, it's been crazy. Like, I can. Um... I experienced something similar in Korea, I guess, but they have, like, a really different culture. Mm -hmm. Like, after our matches at uh, Apex, there'd be, like, lines of people lining up for signatures. But outside of, like, outside of Korea, the other lands I've been to, the fans really haven't, like, interacted that that much. But, Mm -hmm. I mean, you saw at the World Cup how, like, into it the fans were. It was insane. And, like, Jake said it best, like, the crowd was, like, a seventh man for us. Like, they Mm -hmm. they were hyping us super hard. Whenever like one of us made it like a nice play or something we'd hear in the background like the crowd just go crazy and like it definitely it definitely helped that's that was, awesome it was like an unforgettable experience yeah i mean we've we've talked a little bit about um <laughs> some like how the the fan experience can actually affect the game we come uh, death and i come from the world of uh traditional sports and we have some pretty strong opinions on cheering and booing um but yeah, it, it, it's got to be awesome when you're in an arena and you've just got, you know, hundreds if not thousands of fans screaming for you. Usually, yeah. like when you're at a LAN, you uh, you don't notice the crowd, right? Like mm-hmm. you're just focusing on the game. But like, it was impossible not to notice that crowd, and they were all there for us. Yeah, we've been big proponents of not only just the cheering to kind of boost your team, but booing to try to get in the heads of the yeah. opposing team. Um, we want we want to see that a little bit more as well and you know there's a lot of things you can do like when you go to an NFL game the the crowd's really smart about it right like they're loud when it's beneficial to be loud and they're quiet when their offense needs to talk and communicate um, and I think it, it'll be a lot of fun to watch uh, the esports crowd develop and, and grow a little bit in overwatch uh, and, and kind of learn some of those things as the legal should do a really good job of creating a strong fandom I think here uh, in rivalries as well. Um, speaking of rivalries, 
uh, how do you feel? We had last night at the end of Contenders, we had the drawing for the World Cup, and you guys drew South Korea in the first round. Uh, how do you guys feel about that? Have you talked as a team yet about that matchup? Or do you have any uh, insight into you know what's going on in your guys' heads uh, seeing that pairing in the first round? I mean, South Korea is like this looming presence, right? They're like the team to beat. Everyone is there to like try to prove themselves against South Korea. I think that if anyone's going to beat South Korea, it's going to be in the first round. So the there's like a there's a benefit there of us playing them in the first round. I think uh, that's because South Korea is like really strong at um, scouting you out, like reviewing your VOD, studying your play, and then trying to exploit it. So we'll have this factor going into them where they can't use those resources. Okay. Well, uh, taking a look a, a little bit farther back, we talked to uh, Jake a couple weeks ago, and we got a feel for what the tryout process was like to make the team for Team USA. Uh, now, it was involved a lot of players. Was there anybody that stood out to you that didn't make the roster that if you guys were able to bring, uh, you know, one backup player or one reservist, who you know, who would that be and, and why? Um, I think that, like, we picked – a roster that really just clicks together. I don't know if anyone else that tried out would have it as, as much. I mean, a lot of good players like tried out, but like our group, just like I think personality is like the first thing you need to look for when you're making a team, right? And I think that just these six among those that tried out like clicked together really well. Not really sure who else would be able to fit in. All right, and. Uh... Moving our attention away from uh, from the World Cup here and taking a look more at contenders and uh, the team that you're on, FNRG, FE, uh, you know, thinking about when that team formed, uh, even a little bit farther back than that, can you tell us, you, you used to be on Fnatic, and before that, uh, Nautilus was the name of that team. I think it was mostly Nautilus that, that went into the Fnatic uh, roster it as was, well. Uh, hubris. Hubris, okay. That's that was right. what makes rosters, yeah. Yeah, it was and was Nautilus before? Because I think I played against I don't you know under the name Nautilus. Nautilus. Uh, I'm not sure what Nautilus was. No, am I losing my mind? Was it just I Huberson? Think so. Don't look All right. crazy. All right. Well, anyways. <laughs> I all I remember was yeah. your seeing eliminated by Cool Matt sixty nine on my screen every <laughs> five seconds in that Overwatch uh, monthly melee. Not monthly melee. It was the uh, the weeklies. Yeah, um, way back when. Yeah, yeah, this was in closed beta. Um, but can you tell us, you know, why did the old Fnatic team decide not to stick together? What what kind of forced you guys to split up? Um, well, uh, I think Korea was, like, the main catalyst for it, right? No one that went into Korea really survived it, survived the environment, <laughs> and, like, survived unscathed, at least, you know. Everyone had some kind of roster changes, or they dissolved entirely, like in the case of us. And, like, C9 basically dissolved entirely. Uh, we got to like a point where we were so familiar with each other and spent so much time together that we kind of like got to bickering and stuff and this wasn't mm -hmm. it wasn't enjoyable playing with each other anymore and like we had a lot of good times too I think that throughout our history we like we're technically like one of the most successful teams we placed top four at a major international lands all mm -hmm. over I traveled the world playing together but it like ran its course and I think it was kind of inevitable and Korea just kind of catalyzed the process. Like, I guess we just kind of ran our course together, sick of each other. Just, just felt like the right time. Yeah. Well, now, after that, you moved into this FNR GFE roster, and it was kind of fast, right? Like, you guys kind of came out of nowhere on us a little bit as the contender season started. Uh, I know at least I wasn't quite ready to, uh, you know, or I wasn't quite prepared. And then when you guys started playing and everything came up, uh, you know, what caused the team to form? How did you guys meet up? Uh, who's the captain and the in-game shot caller for you guys? I don't know if we have a captain necessarily. Uh, Boink does most of the shot calling, like the strategic okay. stuff and, like, organizational stuff. Um but we're all from different teams, and we're kind of in the same situation. Like, our teams, in light of Overwatch League, our, our team disbanded, and we still wanted to compete. And so we found out that we're of like mind. We approach the game similarly, and we get along. And so it just made sense to play together. Yeah, that does make a lot of sense. I mean, it's such we've talked about it for a number of weeks now. It's just kind of a weird, like, almost like, 
I don't even know how to really explain like a, a eye of the storm type of situation for the for the pro scene where it's like some teams are moving in heavy into Overwatch League, uh, but from the player perspective, you're just kind of you just got to play as much as you can, but you don't want to overcommit to a team. Uh, we talked uh, with Christopher kind of a, a little bit about that um, a couple of weeks ago, but um, in terms of <laughs> in terms of the name, couldn't you have just picked something that wasn't FNRG, FE, Fenergraphy. Yeah, I didn't pick like. the name. I'm not responsible for that. <laughs> I had nothing, nothing to do with that. I was like the last person to join, so yeah, I just gotta like nod my head. Do you know who, <laughs> what? What's the story behind? Was it was it like a troll name, or was it like oh we're just gonna put, mash it all together and let them figure it out? Do you know? They, any... they just mash it all together. The logo has a story behind it, but I can't talk about the story because it's not appropriate. Ah, <laughs> I <gotta> say that. <laughs> Fair enough. We'll uh, we'll leave that for the uh, the unedited version uh, later, uh, later on. Um, is it is it true actually though? Did did Blizzard pay to upgrade your guys's logo once you qualified? I think they 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 didn't pay, but they did want us to upgrade it. Oh, okay, so they 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 forced it to get a little yeah. nicer. I got you. All right. <laughs> um, so we see uh, on Twitter and, and, and other social media that uh, Clockwork is posting looking for an Overwatch League team. So is this kind of an indicator? I mean, you uh, alluded to it a, a second ago, but are you guys just kind of in it for these tournaments before Overwatch League and then you'll kind of be on your merry way? Or is there any sort of want to stay together for, for something greater? Or what, what are your thoughts on that? It'd be great to stay together, but contenders for us and I think every team that isn't already like solidified in OWL, like mm -hmm. you know, Kangarna, even FaZe, like it's just about personal exposure. And mm -hmm. we're at a point where we have to worry about ourselves. I don't think that any roster that you're gonna see that's not already in like Overwatch League, like obviously like Envy hasn't announced anything, but it's Envy, right? Right. But <laughs> our team probably most likely isn't gonna get picked up. Kangarna most likely is not gonna get picked up. I think these teams are going to get poached apart and like we've all kind of accepted that and we're just we're, we're playing together to give exposure to ourselves and try to like work for move forward individually but we've kind of gotten over the idea that we're going to play together in overwatch league well speaking of overwatch league let's talk a little bit more about that can you tell us specifically have any owl teams or organizations contacted you directly and and is there any insight you can provide into you know what their process has been like so far i don't think i can talk about like the inner workings of stuff mm -hmm. uh personally i've received like a lot of offers i think that's mainly due to like the exposure i've gotten through the world cup mm -hmm. so uh in terms of inner workings, I can't really talk about that. I know a lot of teams are going to be doing tryouts very soon. Um, so, like, a lot of teams will be formed uh, from free agents and, like, whoever they can poach from whatever team, you know. But, like, I've been pretty fortunate to get the amount of offers that I've received so far. Well, we won't, we won't ask for many specifics or anything like that, but are there people contacting you? that aren't officially signed to a city yet that we wouldn't know are definitely in the league yet? Um, there are unannounced teams that I've talked to, yes. Ooh. Okay. All right, we'll leave all it right. at that. Yeah, we, we got one <laughs> scrap of information out of you. That's cool. all I need. We'll you. We don't want you to get in trouble. Um, <laughs> now, of the ones that are announced, do you have a dream destination? Do you have a team? Maybe it's you know not the org, it's just the city, or maybe it's the the org and you know the other way around i should say uh you know what's your your desired preference are you willing to declare that um the location isn't important to me as long as it's in north america i'm not really interested in relocating like outside of the country mm -hmm. i think that the first season may and it's just like speculation may center around everyone being in california mm -hmm. so it, it might not make that much of a difference where you are for the first season mm -hmm. but um yeah as long as it's in North America, I don't really care where I go. Okay, I do think they've officially announced that that all the all the week our season one matches will be played uh, in in California. So, um, yeah, that 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 should definitely be the case. But uh, it'll be interesting to see. You know, are there other players more willing to relocate? Because I think teams will have that option to extend you a second year, so it, it might yeah. come into play. I guess it depends on like how many offers you're gonna get, right? If you have one offer and to move to you know Paris or something, then you're gonna take it. 
But yeah. if you have like the luxury of choosing, then you're gonna choose like your home country. Yeah. Um. So, I guess again, we won't. You don't necessarily. You don't have to talk about specifics. But what's <laughs> what's most important, um, for you when choosing a future team, um. Uh, is it is it different when you're choosing an Overwatch League team? So, in the past, you may have chosen the team that you just want that you just think is going to do the best and has the best personality. But is there anything maybe different between choosing a, a team before and after Overwatch League? Uh, I think choosing your team is going to be more important in Overwatch League. Like, mm -hmm. um, I've learned there's like a misconception that you can play with people that you don't really get along with. Mm -hmm. I think long term that you can't do that like when you're building your team the first thing you have to look for is personality compatibility like you have to be able to find people that are agreeable that are receptive to criticism that are like open to discuss strategy and stuff that are mm -hmm. obviously motivated and talk about that kind of stuff and then also mechanically talented like there's plenty of mechanically talented people out there that don't fill those other categories at mm -hmm. all i think that those categories are what you need to look for first Otherwise, we'll get into situations where countless number of teams, including my own in the past, have been in where you get past this like honeymoon phase where everyone's on their best behavior and mm -hmm. you haven't faced any <laughs> adversity yet. And then you take a loss and then everyone's true personality comes out and then your team is on like a nosedive and never recovers. So from this like point onward, for me, when I'm looking for a team, it's going to be like personality first makes a lot of sense and we've talked um we even talked with um devin from uh clg the ceo of clg about how they like he's saying you know the there's a, a lot of players in the top you know five to ten percent in terms of technical skill but it's really like the the longevity of a team and the overall success of a team in the long term is going to be you know the the not right. game related stuff so it's it's interesting to see if if everyone is going to pick up on that or if there's going to be some teams that just kind of crash and burn i think it's just the reality like you can't avoid these personality conflicts like if you don't get along it's going to translate to like how you play a game like it's mm -hmm. a team game you want to support each other like you have to want to support each other like you have to want to play with them you have to ha you have to enjoy it to a certain level like you have to, at the very, very least, respect your teammates to like trust their calls and stuff like that. And if you don't like the person, you don't get along with the person, you're not going to do that. And then it's going to reflect in your play. Like I've experienced it a lot, like through my past teams. I went into like, like a year ago, I would have told you that mm -hmm. you can get past these differences in game, just act professional and stuff like that. But they mm -hmm. just, they manifest themselves, and they do. Right, and especially. You can't avoid it. Yeah, especially when you're going to be. Uh, with each other, you know, even more often and, and living yeah, exactly. in, the, in the same sort of place too. So uh, definitely, I mean, it, it's really, it's in a lot of ways, it's kind of like college, right? Like college roommates, except you're, it's like college, but you're also working with them and it can be even, even crazier. Yeah. Everything's great at first. Always. <laughs> right. Everyone loves their roommate the first week and then. You know, six weeks in, you're both screaming at each other for the ice cube tray that neither of you filled. Um, okay, maybe I'm bringing some of myself into this, but <laughs> <laughs> it's always a little thing. Little yeah. thing. And I live alone. It's like a, uh, it's like a marriage. <laughs> <laughs> exactly right. Once you get out of the honeymoon phase, it's well, it's interesting. Um, but uh, <laughs> enough about my personal life and the things that I've done wrong in the past. Uh, let's talk about um, we, we've talked with uh, Christopher. We've also talked with Jake about um, the seven through 12th players uh, on an Overwatch League roster. So it was announced before um, that. Overwatch League teams can sign up to 12 players. What is what do you think you know teams are going to be doing with that you know seven through 12 spot? Um, you know we've heard a number of different things from they might just have some some subs, they might have flex players, or they might just have an entire second team. Well, what do you, what do you think is the the best usage of of those seven to 12? There's some merit to a second team for like internal practice. So you don't give away strats, mm -hmm. but I think realistically you're not going to see more than like nine to a roster i think it'll include like maybe a specialty player let's say you have the best genji or something and he just plays genji mm -hmm. and he's just the best genji 
So he's going to be on your bench as a Genji if you need him. Um, I think that there's also room on there for, like, keeping a player honest. You know, like someone that gets lazy or mm -hmm. misbehaves. Like, the threat of being replaced by someone on the bench will keep them honest and keep their behavior in check. So I think that you'll see, like, maybe nine people and they'll fill those roles. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure they're going to see 12 too often. Gotcha. I mean, it, it makes sense. It would be the same sort of thing as, like, a... Um traditional sports team as well yeah it's very easy to like i don't know slack off and get complacent if you know your spot is like it's not contested and you're mm -hmm. safe where you are you're in a contract you're gonna get lazy but if you think that you can be replaced then you're gonna work harder that's true i, I guess never really even thought about this it's like you're in a contract you're you are pretty much set you really could just unless there's like certain performance based like goals that you need to do or something like you can just yeah. kind of like slack off and just like yep nope i'm a pro player i'm gonna just do this for the rest of the year uh <laughs> just you know, chill yeah which would be kind of weird i mean it wouldn't be weird it would be like against the spirit of overwatch league in every single way but <laughs> i, I would guess not too many people with that kind of attitude would put in the effort to get that good at video at a video game to begin with though. well you now know i have a new goal just, to get... <laughs> just get in the league and chill. Yeah, get in the league. It's like Actually, um, what was that? What was the show? Uh, Blue Mountain State with um, the like backup quarterback. He's like, no, I'm I'm purposely the backup. I get all the benefits of being on the team, but I don't have to do anything. It's like, yep, I'm the back. I'm the backup uh, Lucio player. Yep. It's like just hope hope my Lucio player doesn't get injured and I'll be good. <laughs> <laughs> Also, if any Overwatch League teams are looking for a backup Lucio player, uh, at the underscore Blevins on Twitter. Uh, <laughs> I don't even think they I could legally get in with my skill rating. But <laughs> let's move on um, from Overwatch League uh, and move more into some of the, the uh, patches and, and changes that have happened to the actual game. Um, do you have any initial thoughts on the uh, D.Va and also Mercy reworks? Have you played them at all? Um. The Mercy stuff, like, I'm glad that they're going in the, in the direction where they want to make Mercy a mechanically skilled hero because mm -hmm. it's, like, you know, a really big topic right now that you can play Mercy. Mercy requires very, very limited skill, and you can have, like, a decent amount of success. Like, you can climb with it, and it's just kind of silly. Um, but, like, the specifics there, I don't I don't know about Mercy, but, but in terms of D.Va, um, her changes, I think that in order for her to be played still her damage is going to have to do enough to like make her a threat mm -hmm. i think she'll still function as like a peeler but more like roadhog like old roadhog mm -hmm. you know old roadhog you would be afraid of diving the back line because the old roadhog would just hook you and kill you mm -hmm. so maybe diva will right now diva is like a, a peeler for your supports and that you do you peel through mitigating damage removing damage entirely but she could still function as that role except um Instead of mitigating damage, you'll just deal enough damage to deter their dive. Mm -hmm. I don't know if she's going to be like an additional dive threat because you use, you use a lot of matrix to keep yourself alive. And you're going to have like no matrix next patch compared to now. So I don't know if she's going to be able to like dive in and kill someone the way like Monkey and Genji are. But I could see her functioning still as a peeler that deals lots of damage. Yeah, I mean, we've talked about it a little bit. She's her role seems like it's going to change a lot. Um, yeah. We're not... They want to change the play style, which is fine. Like, I, know, I think that people really underestimate how much D.Va, like the skill cap of D.Va. I think that mm -hmm. people don't take the time to actually get good at D.Va and even like understand how much a D.Va has to do in, in the game. I think D.Va is like the most impactful hero and you have so many choices to make it every single time. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I definitely haven't learned how to perfect Eva. I just play a very, very right. mediocre one. <laughs> Everyone just, like, says, hold right-click and then go AFK. But it's, like, it's so much more than that. <laughs> you, you can, like, you can control the fight so much just based on your decision. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, personally, I want to see her still be played, but I'm fine completely with her play style being changed up entirely yeah. even. Plus, we get some awesome rockets to shoot now. Um, yeah, I mean, she's gonna, she's gonna like nerfing the matrix is gonna open up a lot of the game too. Yeah. Like Anna, you don't hear about it very often, but Anna would be is, is countered by Diva like pretty hard. 
you mm-hmm. they're gonna eat the nade, eat the heals, and that's gonna open up the Anna, it's gonna open up um Tact Visor, open up mm-hmm. Junkrat. Junkrat's being buffed as it is, so it's hard to predict exactly where stuff's gonna land because you know, you gotta play in scrims for like a month before it really settles. Mm-hmm. But I think that this could be a patch that's gonna change like the meta a lot just with all these buffs and nerfs. Mm-hmm. So what you're saying is CoolMat69 confirmed Junkrat player once they nerfed you. I wish. <laughs> I love Junkrat. I think everybody wishes that at some level. They want to be fun. the Junkrat of Overwatch. Yeah. It's like so, everyone's tired of playing what they always play, and yeah. then Junkrat's like this like crazy hero yeah. that you never it's just get a, a chance meme. to play. Yeah. He literally is a meme, and then they made the video of him just being a meme. Um, so spe- speaking of, of having fun playing the game and, and playing characters you want, who is actually your favorite character to play? Well, right now it's D.Va, and I, I just believe that D.Va has, like, a really high skill cap and, and that you, you influence the game so much, like, based off of your mm-hmm. decisions. And even though, like, that's not the, the, the common conception, mm-hmm. like, I think that people just aren't playing her to her potential. I think, like... Whether we win a fight or not, a lot base is based off of my decisions, and like I, I can always like think about what I could do better and like work harder, and and then there's like there's this factor with diva bombs too, where I think diva bombs are the highest like the highest skill cap thing in the game. You can always mm-hmm. get kills with bombs, but you really never do. There's, there's just always room to improve with diva. I, like I really enjoy playing diva. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I I found uh, a similar, even though I'm I'm significantly worse by all accords uh it, it was it's always fun to find those those spots to throw the bomb and to actually affect the fight um and what other uh what other heroes can you play at pro level like what like what is your i guess like top you know three or four that you play uh at that you would play in competition um last few months it's been diva only but new patches opened up like zarya a bit mm-hmm. some soldier really i'm just practice on diva a bit of zarya like I'd say I'm very confident on my Diva and I'm almost there on my Zarya. It's like I think that whatever I'm required to play, mm-hmm. I can play. Like it just given enough time. So I've been like I've been required to play Diva and I put the time into it and I've gotten like exceptional at it, I think. So I'm not really concerned about meta ships and stuff like that. I've been I've been like decently relevant to every meta, so I'm not that worried. Well, looking back at when I when I found you and when I, I saw you streaming, you played a lot of hit scan back then, and I I think that's where you were, uh, you know, at some of your earlier teams. Uh, I was always a big fan of you on hit scan. Is that anything you think you'll ever get back to, or are you going to be uh, mostly just purely flex or like off tank going forward? Kind of happy where I am. Um, yeah. My role has it's like there's hardly any players that play my role at a high level, which is pretty good. Like going in Overwatch League, honestly. Um, people don't really like to. It seems like people don't really like to get exceptional at my role. Everyone's like trying to get really good at DPS, so that makes mm. my role a lot easier to like stand out in. Right. Um, I'm also comfortable on it too. Like initially when I switched to flex off of McCree, I was like kind of against it, but I'm happy where I've landed. But I don't think that I'm gonna go back to like dedicated hits can ever unless the meta really requires it. Well, I don't have to like it, but I get it. And I'll, I'll yeah. accept it. I'll accept it. <laughs> Got to make um, yourself marketable. <laughs> all right. One last question before we let you go here, Matt. Uh, looking at the way Contenders has played out over the first couple weeks, there's been a lot of really surprising results here. Uh, and I'm, I'm very curious. Uh, obviously, Doomfist is playing some role in that. You know, you look at players like Leaf, you know, how he's been able to kind of elevate Gamers Origins uh, over on the EU side of things. How has Doomfist affected Phenergraphy's ability to game plan <laughs> and you know go throughout uh, you know the maps because there's is it something where it's a map specific comp or is it teams just pull it out whenever they want to? You know, how is it affecting your game planning ability? Um, I mean, Doomfist owns right. I think that we <laughs> underutilize them. That's like the main issue we have with Doomfist is that we just don't we don't play them enough. Uh, we're kind of addressing that right now and we're playing him more. He's just like this factor. He's like old Roadhog, right? Where he can just... Sometimes he does nothing and just goes in and feeds. But other times he'll kill like three people instantly. It's like this... Just this random factor. And our issue is is that we just don't play him enough. We're trying to... We're we're like... We're focusing now more on like getting buds to play him more. And uh, maybe we'll 
have more success. I'm kind of like a bit disappointed in our results recently in tournaments. Like, I mean, scrims are scrims, but our scrims are like god tier. We don't lose scrims to like anyone, which is, <laughs> which is, but just in tournaments, we just don't, I don't know, we don't, we don't turn on the same way. Hmm. All right. Well, definitely really, really appreciate you coming by and talking with us and, you know, discussing everything that's going on. You're clearly a busy guy, uh, and, you know, with everything that you're doing and involved with and, you know, the things you're planning for in the future. So I uh, really appreciate you taking the time to come on and have a conversation with us. Um, like I said, I've, you know, like Blevin said earlier, I've, I've been a big fan of you for a while. So I look forward Thank to you. watching you grow into the Overwatch League. Uh, I look forward to purchasing a cool Matt jersey. Matt, please, though, please, I cannot <laughs> tell you enough how upset I will be if you sign with New England or Boston. I just please don't do it. Why? I can't. I, <laughs> I am a huge NFL yes. fan. Oh, my God, do it. <laughs> I am a huge NFL fan, and I just, my team's in the same division as the Patriots, and I just, I can't oh, no. do it. I cannot, under any circumstances, about this, root for anybody <laughs> uh, that signs there. So, please... <laughs> Uh, I'm. I don't know. I'll DM Huck and tell him you said In, some nasty things about him. Whatever I got to do to keep you off that con- team. Conversely, uh, will... <laughs> will be my favorite player on my favorite team. So just it's, it's a yeah, yin and yang. Levins is just a huge troll. So don't worry too much about that. <laughs> Um, he would absolutely buy your jersey and wear it every time he ever saw me, though. I pre- I'm fairly certain that would happen. 100%. Um, but I, just my personal – I will never ask any other player, but it's you. I, I've been vocal about you being my favorite player. Please don't do it. It will, it will crush me. It will God, crush me. I'm so happy when that happens. <laughs> you will reduce a 30-year-old man to tears. Uh, it, w- <laughs> it could right, potentially no happen. Me, <laughs> just, just keep it in mind. Just keep it in mind. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah, Matt, that's all we've got. Are there any last minute things that you want to say? Any shout outs you want to give? Anything? You know, just you know, thanks for having me. That's really it. Awesome, man. Glad to be here. It's like the first thing I've first podcast I've really done and it's been fun. Nice. Glad. Well, Matt, you're you're cool Matt sixty nine. You're welcome back anytime and for better or for worse, you are now forever a friend of High Noon Podcast. Uh you can't get rid of that title. It's just not a thing that we will ever allow. Um, <laughs> There's only one thing you can do to rescind that invite. Don't forget. Don't, don't don't Boston. No, you <laughs> I'm will. signing right now, actually. You will actually. Yeah, it's, like, it's, it's like Huck is actually I'll go in the background. Tissues. That's, why, that's why you couldn't turn the camera on. It's because Huck is in the background right now. <laughs> he's at the he's at um, the Patriots Stadium he right now. He mad, too. <laughs> the urgency with which you asked me why has me just terrified. <laughs> I'm not even going to lie. It just has me terrified. <laughs> Um, like, why? And I'm like, oh, oh no, man, don't do it. Oh, so good, so, so nice good. Though. But so uh, we don't want to. We don't want to let anything slip that's gonna get uh, you in trouble. So we'll cut it there. Again, cool, Matt sixty nine. Thank you for coming on the show, guys. We're gonna pass it back over to the present or future or past us. But uh, huge shout outs to cool, Matt sixty nine, and thank you again. Yeah, thanks for having me. All right, that was a pretty great interview. Certainly not awkward for the people who are watching live. And don't do it, Matt. Wondered why. Don't, <laughs> don't do it. Do it. Do don't it. You'll be my favorite dare. player. You'll Dead be my me. favorite player. Um, <laughs> I, so we can finally mention it. though. There's unannounced teams out there. Yes, there uh, are unannounced teams. Ooh, we've ooh, been ooh, yes. Ooh. So he, he, if you missed it, he told us that he's been. Uh, Teams that have not been announced yet have reached out to him uh, to try to sign him. So I think that means for season one, we will have more than the teams that we already have out there. I think we all kind of thought that was true, Mm -hmm. but it's good to actually have the confirmation of it. And it's not official confirmation, but I'm rolling with it. I didn't. It's I mean, it's almost better than official confirmation, right? right? Like we got it from someone who's actually experiencing it. Right. Like, tell me he wasn't contacted because he has emails to disagree with you. Right. Uh, <laughs> Unless he was just blatantly lying for absolutely no gain whatsoever. <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. So anyways, um, looking next week, uh, who do you want to tell them? Tell everybody who we've got for the interview for next episode. Yes, we have the um, I'm blanking right now. We have the. <laughs> 
I'm going to be talking with him in an hour and a half. I was going to say, it's the one you're recording tonight, right? Yeah, I'm pretty sure. Uh, we have the team manager for Immortals, whose name is eluding me right now. I'm going to look like an idiot. I believe idea. it's Joshua Kim. Yes, you. that is correct. Um, so uh, Joshua so- Kim, the, it's, this is going to be our first one in a while that's not an actual player, but rather the team manager. So we're going to have a whole other slurry of questions. We've actually got this uh, this interview filled out quite nicely. Um, it's going to be just me, but you guys will see that um, next week. And then we actually also have, yeah. slurry is a word now. The Blevins just invented it. I've never heard of slurry before. Slurry? No, I think you combined slew and flurry. <laughs> I sure did. <laughs> <laughs> You're great uh, at just shoving these words together to yeah. make things that sound better than the they actual grammatically correct way to say it anyways. Better. Yeah. We're uh, we're great at making up words. Yeah, we're so great. Um but yes. And yeah, that that's all I've got, Death. Is there anything is there anything else that we wanna I promise I'll keep it brief, but we do have an iTunes review that I want to get to here. Blazing yes. Bob, actually, fellow podcaster, left left us a five star review said <laughs> been listening to this podcast since they started and i've always enjoyed their witty banter and intelligent coverage of overwatch esports <laughs> clearly he left this comment on the wrong page uh, i've always wanted to give a five-star review but i thought the auto quality issues took one star away i refused to give a four-star rating and below rating so i waited uh the audio over the last few episodes has not had any issues so i can finally give them their well-deserved five stars looking forward to booing with you all at blizzcon definitely bob if we were going we would be booing also super, bob super if hard. you have an in on an extra ticket i'll 100 percent go yeah you will have somebody to boo with you so yes i'm still looking for tickets and actually we'll just put that out there if anyone has any sort of in to tickets money is negotiable uh <laughs> I, it, I, i'll find a way to make it work if we have an in uh to some tickets but Tis neither here nor there. That's going to be it, guys. Thanks, everyone, for listening. Thank you to CoolMet69 for doing such an awesome interview. Um, please just do it, man. Just just sign with them. Don't you dare. Don't you dare. You don't have to hide it anymore. We already aired it. Don't go to New England. <laughs> go to Boston's New England. just the worst. The best. The worst. The best. I'll go to your first home match, and I will uh, personally high-five you. I won't. I will. <laughs> Um, but that's going to be it guys. Uh, huge thanks to everyone for listening. Huge thanks to all the patrons, um, including our newest patron from Buffalo, Mr. Kashi Han, Kashi Han. Yes. Kashi Han. Um, again, if anyone's from Buffalo, let us know. We'll shout you out. Um, you can always head on over to patreon.com slash high noon podcast. Uh, if you want to support us there, you can also just go to high noon podcast.com. All of our links everywhere are there, including our new public discord. You can go in there, talk to all, all of the celebrities of, uh, high noon podcast, the a Smiths, the thorn reigns, the overwatch today's the croaks, the everybody, everyone you, you know, and love from the high noon podcast fam is there. Um, huge thanks to Maturino for sponsoring our SoundCloud. So all the SoundCloud users can thank Maturino for that. And also huge thanks to Adam Hoek who made the awesome outro music, which you're going to hear in just a second. I'm done again, guys. I am the Blevins for death blow. Remember it's high noon. Got his boots and he put on his hat. Same day, it's in his past, and he's not looking back. He says, Finding mine now, God's my way. He's not good, but he sure ain't bad. He'll make amends for the sins that he has. He says, I'll change the world one bullet at a time till I find mine. Soldier says, If you're trying to not do a three hour episode, Don't do a three-hour episode anyway.